Good morning. Welcome to the June board meeting of the Food Standards Agency. Um, I'd like to start today with uh, a couple of apologies from board members. Uh, Julie Pierce and Colin McKenna will arrive a little later uh, during the meeting this morning. Uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome our new board members, uh, Lord Blancathra and Fiona Gately. Uh, you're very welcome at your first board meetings uh, today. Um, I'd also uh, very warmly welcome Professor Susan Jebb, who uh, is the incoming chair for the Food Standards Agency. And I wonder, Susan, if you would like to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, it's a huge uh, privilege to be appointed to chair the FSA, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know the board members and, of course, the, the wider uh, constituency of stakeholders for the FSA. Um, but uh, I will take up post on the 1st of July, and I'm extremely grateful to Ruth for uh, continuing in her very sort of competent role as, as interim chair, um, particularly for this board meeting today, which has, has got uh, so many important uh, papers to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. We really look forward to you starting in post uh, in July. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to give notice that um, if I lose internet connection for any reason, that Margaret Gilmore will kindly take over chairing the meeting. Uh, do any board members have any conflicts of interest to declare? I can't say any. No, thank you. And do any board members have any items of any other business they wish to raise? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to move on now to questions that we've received in advance of the meeting and invite Justin Everard, Acting Director of Communications, to read out the questions, please, Justin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, there are two questions uh, we have for the board meeting today. The first question comes from uh, Maria Obradovich. She is head, head legal analyst at cbdintel.com. CBD Intel is a company that provides regulatory and market intelligence for the CBD sector. And her question is, would it be possible to share updates on the progress of novel food applications? How many applications have you rejected so far? And when will you complete the list of applications for products that will be allowed to stay on the market until verified? Uh, the second questions to, uh, today come from uh, Paul Carey, Owen's father of the Owen's Law campaign, and Mr. Carey says, could the FSA board please confirm its supporting principle, subject to the demonstration of an evidence base, of implementing Owen's Law, which, inter alia, calls for restaurants to state the allergens in each dish they offer in writing on the face of the menu? Uh, Paul has attached an executive summary document uh, which sets this out, and as he says, sets this out together with three other changes the Owens Law campaign seeks in respect of consumers who are at risk of anaphylaxis. Uh, he, Paul comments, could the FSA board note that such practice, as called for by the Owens Law campaign, is already achieved by large restaurant chains such as Weatherspoons and smaller establishments such as the Seabreeze restaurant in Abu Dhabi in, on Cardigan Bay coastline, in Wales. And those are the two questions for today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as usual, uh, responses will be provided and uh, where possible uh, items will be covered during discussion on papers uh, during the meeting today. Can I now move on to the minutes of the uh, 9th of March board meeting? Are board members uh, happy to accept the minutes as an accurate record? Yes, I'm getting positive affirmation. Okay, thank you. Minutes of the 26th of May board meeting. Um, I'm asking board members to accept these minutes as well as an accurate record. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so actions arising. Uh, any comments from anyone? No? Okay, we'll move on. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so uh, moving on to uh, my report to the board, um, well, we've already um, met Susan Jeb and um, congratulated her, and I was going to report that uh, uh, she would start on the 1st of July. I will, of course, return to my role as deputy chair from that point onwards, um, and I look very much look forward to Susan starting and uh, extend warm congratulations to her. Um, my uh, engagements since the March board meeting uh, have been published on food.gov, 
www.ofsec.uk website. And um, just to say, we have no chief executive report for the board today, as we've only three weeks since the May board meeting. Uh, but we do have uh, a report from Emily uh, for the business committee later on. Um, so uh, just to explain that uh, we didn't want to do another chief exec report so quickly after the last one. Um, OK, so we'll move on to strategic papers. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Professor Robin May, our Chief Scientific Advisor, to introduce his first annual report. And as he says in his introduction to report, all his time uh, in role at the FSA has been virtual. So it's a huge achievement and uh, many congratulations on uh, your first year. Uh, so, um, Robin, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, it, it's been a particularly bizarre year for uh, those of us who've joined the organisation in the last 12 months. Um, to date, I have met only one colleague in the flesh in the last 12 months. I'm looking forward, I hope, in the coming 12 months to meeting far more people in person. Uh, you have my report in front of you, so I don't intend to reiterate uh, the entire thing. I just wanted to pick out a few key points and then uh, throw the floor open for questions uh, with your permission, Chair. Um, the first thing I'd like to put very much on record is despite the fact that I have done my entire first year uh, from uh, my study here in, uh, in Worcestershire, um, uh, I've had an incredibly warm welcome from colleagues right across the organisation and I'd like to uh, really, really emphasise how uh, important that has been to progress over the last year. Um, I'd also like to put on record my enormous thanks to my predecessor, Guy Poppy, who uh, could, I could not have wished for a better handover. He has been enormously supportive um, and much of what he has put in train has made my life uh, very easy over the last 12 months. So uh, I think it has been a really strong year for, uh, for the FSA science. Um, there are a large number of items mentioned in my report that I think are particularly noteworthy. I'm just going to pick out a couple here. For instance, our uh, Food and U2 survey, uh, which out of necessity primarily has gone to a push to web uh, mechanism over the last 12 months. That has been enormously successful and really helped uh, in terms of gaining data at a time when, of course, most of us have been uh, stuck at home for a large part of the year. It's really helped lay the framework for the data that we will use over the coming uh, years. And I think that's a, a really pioneering piece of behavioural science. Similarly, uh, we've continued to engage very widely uh, with uh, colleagues outside of the organisation. And you'll see at point 3.5, um, a list of uh, fellowships and other activities we are undertaking with uh, research organisations right around the UK. And I think that's something that is a real strength of FSA science and something that I hope very much that we'll continue to build on over the coming years. Uh, in my report, I make a number of recommendations, and I'd just like to highlight uh, four here. Uh, the first is in terms of our scientific advisory committees. Uh, we have a, a large number of scientific advisory committees that provide an absolutely invaluable resource in terms of their expert guidance on risk assessments, on uh, the wider scientific landscape. Um, they do a sterling work, uh, and I think it would be really nice if we could ensure that is more visible than it currently is outside of the organisation and across government. And particularly, I'm keen to see us join up more with the scientific advisory committees and other government departments and maximise the interaction between um, those committees. I know this is an ambition shared uh, by my opposite number, chief scientific advisors and other departments. And so we're working together to try and achieve that. Um, and this is building very much on some activity that uh, Guy started when he was in my role uh, previously. Secondly, FSA uh, launches every year a large number of external research calls. We commission uh, experts to do all sorts of different things. Um, this is, again, a, a key component of FSA science. And I think it's really critical that we ensure those calls are as visible and as engaging as we possibly can make them. There are opportunities for us to engage more widely with the academic community and for the academic community and research community more broadly to engage with us. And so one of the pieces of work that we are undertaking internally with colleagues in comms, uh, science and evidence, um, and uh, within finance is to try and ensure that those uh, external calls are, are highly visible and recruiting really the very best bids we possibly can. Thirdly, uh, I am extremely conscious, uh, as you mentioned, Ruth, that I have uh, gone very, uh, pretty much nowhere over the last 12 months. And in particular, I have not met colleagues um, in uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. I have not been out to engage with stakeholders because of uh, COVID restrictions. I'm very much hoping uh, that it will change in the coming months. And I'm looking forward to strengthening those links. There is great science all over the United Kingdom, and it would be really good to be able to go and hear more about it and engage um, with, with those stakeholders wherever possible. 
And lastly, uh, there are a number of recommendations in my report in relation to COVID-19. I think the agency's response to COVID-19 has been truly remarkable. It's really impressive to see how um, not only basic standard operational activities, but also the wider future scientific uh, platform has really grown over the last 12 months, despite all the constraints. Um, and I think it's really uh, an amazing opportunity for us to now build on that and continue to expand going forwards. For instance, um, with greater access to things like healthcare data, um, consumer tracker data to understand how uh, food standards are changing, how food uh, behaviours in consumers and food businesses change as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. We're extremely well placed to do that and it's something I'm very much hoping that um, the FSA will continue to build on. Um, and lastly, just to highlight, uh, we have been very engaged with other departments over the last 12 months in a number of areas, and one in particular, uh, which we are hoping to hear about soon, is a, is a combined venture with uh, DEFRA and uh, DHSC, Department of Health and Social Care, um, to try and build a larger infrastructure for the surveillance of pathogens. We don't have an answer on that bid yet, um, but that is something that and similar proposals uh, for sort of large cross-departmental working are something I think where FSA can play a really key role um, and I look forward to doing much more of that in the future. Uh, that uh, summarises my report Chair and I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed Robin and uh, we'll take any reflections and questions. So I think Margaret you're first up. Oh okay. Um, wow uh, Robin uh, this um, it is a fascinating report, um, really fascinating and it's, it's great that we're so across so much of the science you can't have imagined, as you said, when you started, um, how you'd still be grappling with uh, the COVID and with obviously protocol issues post EU exit. Um, I have a couple of questions and some points. On page four, I, I, as somebody who's not in the acad academic world now, I was surprised to hear that potential um, researchers may not hear when we um, plan for new projects. Um, and I would have thought that would have been quite easy to you know, link into university and research institute platforms. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> on page seven of your report, you mention uh, foodborne diseases down due to the work, uh, to the, due to the way we as a society behave during COVID, for example, around GP surgeries. And I wondered how quickly you felt we could analyze the data and um, provide evidence where um, a change in practices and behaviours have really worked um, and where sh we should keep up those um, practices permanently or try and encourage that in wider society. And then on future policies, I wondered how much work we're doing to mitigate against the risk of um, some of the hugely uh, successful work we've done on antimicrobial resistance being undone if um, through inadvertently through various trade deals, we might let in more antibiotics in meat than we're used to. Um, how can we you know, encourage trade as the government wants us to do? And um, we're happy to do whilst ensuring that we maintain our very high current standards on that. Um, and then finally, you mentioned food labeling, uh, much of which was taken from the FSA into other departments including nutrition and obesity a while back, apart from in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think bringing this together sounds like a really good idea. So there would be one lead on labelling, and as you put it, not necessarily us. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you would see um, the ideal situation. Robin, do you want to comment on those points? And I'll bring others in with a few more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so uh, remind me, Margaret, if I've missed any, I've scribbled them down as we, we were talking. Uh, firstly, in terms of visibility of our external uh, calls, um, I think there is a mixture of things going on here. Uh, one of which is that as a, an academic, uh, still part-time and previously full-time, um, I think that academics tend not to look at government departments uh, generally as a source of funding. Um, we tend to focus very much on the research councils, for example, Innovate UK, places like that. Um, so there is certainly a piece of sort of ambassador work that we can do there to raise visibility. Um, and that is something that we are already actively engaged with. I know that comms colleagues are looking to, for example, um, uh, uh, sort of make more accessible to an academic community our, our web pages that report on this. 
Um, but secondly, there is the issue of the actual application itself. Um, all government applications for external tenders go through a similar portal, and it's very different to the kind of grant application portal that your average university or research institute uh, researcher would uh, submit. And so there is a sort of element of uh, uh, familiarity building, I think, there. And again, that's something that I think both within FSA and more broadly across government, we can do better and, and fairly easily, I think, to have sort of very simple explainers in a similar way to the way that we currently do for uh, food businesses putting in applications, for example, to help them write the right things on the document. So that's something that is very much in train and I think will make a big difference in due course. Um, in terms of uh, um, AMR, you raised the point about AMR. So yes, absolutely, AMR is a, is a key priority for the UK as a whole and FSA in particular. Um, clearly, over the last year, it has somewhat slipped down everybody's radar because of COVID-19, but is certainly very much re-emerging. Um, we are very engaged right across government and internationally on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and in fact, we have a meeting with the One Health AMR group next week. Um, so this is a cross-government initiative to ensure join up between agencies and departments on AMR. Um, I think the, the world as a whole is, is still very aware of that. And I think the key here is about international join up. We need to ensure that um, standards are, are held high everywhere. Um, and as part of that, it, it's a process that goes right it across the food chain from uh, agriculture and the environment through to food in our shops. Um, we are uh, speaking very regularly with colleagues in, across all those different uh, organisations, in particular, for example, Emily and I met some time ago with uh, Rumour, uh, which is the organisation that helps uh, reduce antimicrobial use in agriculture. Um, and I think those conversations need to keep happening and are happening now. So, so I'm relatively optimistic that uh, we are in a good position to ensure continued AMR um, uh, continued progress on AMR. Uh, in terms of foodborne disease reporting, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the bottom line is we don't know um, what the data really looked like for last year because so much of our data comes from uh, things like GP uh, reporting, which people, of course, were not doing last year. So we don't yet know whether the apparent dip is uh, totally spurious and is just because people weren't going to their GPs to report it or partially true and partially spurious or entirely true as a result of hygiene change practices. And that I think is something that we very much hope will come out of the data that I mentioned in, in one of my recommendations. As we go forwards now um, and start to emerge, we will start to see a pattern of data that we could then use to reflect back. So for instance, if we suddenly go back to exactly where we were before, we can then start to ask the question about whether that dip was just artificial or whether it, this is because people have suddenly forgotten to wash their hands again. So I think we will get answers there, but it will take some time for the data to fall out. Uh, and the last question I think you raised on labelling. Um, and yes, absolutely. Labelling, as you mentioned, is, a, is a clearly a cross-departmental and, and cross-nation issue. And, and I think the conversation has to be held at that level to make this work well. And indeed, uh, that is exactly what is about to start happening. So colleagues at FSA have convened a workshop uh, for July um, with colleagues in other departments, particularly uh, Department of Health and Social Care and DEFRA, um, uh, to, to start discussing uh, both short-term uh, kind of labelling uh, potential and, and the long-term, I guess, trajectory. Where might we ultimately want to get to with a perfect food label that does everything that consumers want to see on it without overwhelming people with data? So that's a very active discussion and one that I hope to be able to tell you more about as it progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Robin. Uh, so we have a number of other comments. Um, perhaps I'll take, uh, we have four people, so I'll take two and two. Uh, so Mark and Tim, I think you were next. Mark. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I'll, I'll be fairly brief. Mine is a, is a reflection rather than a question. Uh, two things, Robin, how has it been a year already? Uh, this is very impressive. Uh, there's a load of stuff in here, and it's really, obviously, as we try and make science the heart of decision-making, most of this is really important stuff. But the bit I'm really pleased to see in here is actually the bit where you start with the word lastly, uh, and that's the reflection on the need for us to have access to what colleagues on this call will have heard me call before operational science, uh, so the laboratory capacity that supports our delivery partners uh, in making the decisions they need to make. And I just wanted to particularly welcome the fact that that's clearly on your radar uh, and hope that uh, it does stay there and that we make some good progress in that space. I know we have anecdotal evidence of some of our Port Health colleagues struggling to access the science that they need. Um, hopefully that's just teething problems now that we've left the EU, uh, but it's a really important subject from my point of view and I really welcome it being on your report. Thanks very much, Mark. Timothy. 
Thanks very much. Yes, uh, really well done, Robin. I think you've hit the ground running and uh, despite the virtual world we live in. And I was really pleased to see the great progress strategically. And I think around commissioning research priorities and uh, securing evidence is absolutely key. Um, I like to see the focus on uh, health economics. I'd like to see more, um, and particularly, I guess, this links to the labelling issue as well, in that the, if we are doing something collaboratively with other government departments, particularly around quality, safety and provenance, is looking at a joint approach to ensure that is evidence-based. And I guess... Uh, I, my question that comes from that is whether or not we can do more around securing uh, both uh, health economic, social economics and environmental economic data and be able to bring that together in a way that better informs the consumer. Because if we do meet some of the targets, both environmentally, but also in the trying to improve nutrition and achieve safety, then that has to be a combined approach. And so hearing your reflections on that would be enormously helpful. Thanks, Robin. Do you want to comment on either of those two points? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yes, uh, just briefly, Mark, absolutely, I totally agree. I can't believe it's been a year either. Um, and, and Timothy, I, I feel like I've done everything except for any running over the last year. I don't think I've moved out of this seat, actually. Um, but uh, but no, very, both very valid points. Um, slightly more seriously, in terms of lab capacity, absolutely, this is a conversation that we're having, uh, Mark, uh, regularly across government, ensuring that you know we have sufficient lab capacity, not only now, but also for the future. Science moves very rapidly, technology develops. Um, it's really Really important to make sure we have access to the right kit uh, going forward to, to ensure that our science is the best it possibly uh, can be. In terms of economic data, Tim, yeah, absolutely. Um, we obviously have very good links with economic modelling, we have very good economic modelling within the FSA, but also good links elsewhere into, for example, HMRC, Treasury, uh, DHSC. Um, I think there is a real opportunity there to, uh, to to kind of almost do more, to maximise more in both directions. And I know that um, Judy, unfortunately, is obviously not here today, but I know that if she was here, she would say the key to this is about data standards, data trusts and sharing of data. There's a lot of work going on there. Um, and I think that's going to be you know, an exciting area of development for the UK. Bigger challenge internationally, because of course the, the challenge of transmitting data internationally, but a large willingness, I would say, um, amongst colleagues in other countries, particularly we've had very constructive discussions with FDA in the United States recently about whether we might ultimately be able to help build things that go beyond uh, national borders. So, um, so yes, all moving in the right direction. Big, big challenge, but quite exciting, I think. Thank you, Robin. So Lord Blencathra and then Peter Price. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Colin, uh, so Robin, I too look forward to meeting you in, in person in the near future, hopefully. Now, you've set the bar very high. You've done a highly impressive report from your study in Worcestershire. So goodness knows how you'll top it next year when you can actually get out and about and, and, and see things on the ground. Now, I was particularly interested in your paragraph 3.2D, the use of data and digital innovations. Now, what forecast can you make of the extra work we might be able to do or the amount of money we could actually save if we opted for the fastest possible adoption of new data techniques, DNA, digital technologies, and what would be the annual cost to us of investing in such technologies? Thank you. And Peter? Robin, thank you very much for last week virtually attending our Welsh Advisory Committee. That was much appreciated and your report, which we looked at at that time, uh, was very well received. We were very impressed with the scale of work that you've undertaken in the relatively short time that you've been there. Um, one of the things that attention was drawn to was in the sources of research work, um, that there are a number of Welsh higher education institutions which are uh, working in this sort of field, and the committee was keen to underline uh, in your mind that those sources were available. The other thing um, in practice, Paragraph 3.7, you draw attention to uh, individual research calls 
typically receiving relatively few bids. And that looks a very interesting area. And uh, the actions that you're recommending, uh, I would strongly support uh, user-friendly digital platform to increase the visibility of the research calls um, so that you actually have that wider reach uh, seems very worthwhile. And the other thing uh, in your report that I'd like to just pick up is paragraph 5.6, where you talk about the importance of consumer tracking. And one of the things that uh, comes up there is concerns about food affordability. And that's another thing which uh, the Welsh Committee frequently comes back to as a matter of concern. Uh, and I'm wondering, in your particular field of scientific research, where you take the information, what are you going to do with the information that you gain from that tracker about food affordability? Thank you. Robin. Thank you very much for those. Uh, uh, if it's uh, all right with you, I will take them in reverse order. Um, uh, in terms of, Peter, in terms of uh, Welsh engagement, absolutely. So we, I know we, we do have uh, regular engagement with research colleagues in Wales and indeed Northern Ireland and with our opposite numbers through FSS in, in Scotland. Um, for instance, in, in Wales, I know we've had engagement with colleagues at Bangor and Aberystwyth uh, fairly recently. I, of course, have not uh, set foot over the border in the last 12 months, unfortunately, so I've not had direct interactions. And that's something I'd really like to, to put high on the list as soon as we can start to travel again. Um, and there is a wider question there, I think, which... Um, it links into your point, the, the, your subsequent point about the visibility of research calls. I think across the piece, our research calls are not as visible as uh, they might be. Um, and that therefore gets kind of uh, augmented, if you like, uh, when they're in, in places like Wales and Northern Ireland, where there are uh, relatively fewer uh, higher education uh, institutions than in England. So we see this kind of dip in those areas. And that is something I very much would like us to uh, to, to work towards overcoming. Um, and I think the key there is engagement. It's about visibility. It's about getting out and telling people about the science that we do, the science we'd like to do, and hearing about the things that, that they are doing that, that might be useful to us. So, so yes, very much about a, a kind of um, engagement process, I think. Uh, in terms of um, your comments about bids generally to our research calls, there's a mixture of things there, I think. Some of our research calls are, of course, very precise and we want an exact type of science for an exact question and therefore we're not expecting to get very many bids because not many people could deliver it but there are i think there is still i think space for um uh, the more broader calls to to garner more attention and again it's about that visibility that we're that we're working on now and lastly, on your points about um, consumer tracking data, and I guess our data more generally, absolutely. I mean, as, as we all know on this call, um, the FSA is totally committed to transparent uh, evidence, and I 100% and I endorse that. Um, so I am very keen that all of our data um, in these kind of emerging from these projects is published um, in, as academic uh, outputs, but also as outputs that are useful to people with a non-academic uh, background. So we often do a lot of work, for example, in, um, in sort of consumer data that really explains the trends we're seeing, what it means for the average consumer, what it might mean for food businesses. And that's absolutely something I want to see us do um, with the data that emerges from these COVID-based uh, consumer trackers too. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to update you on that as it emerges in the coming months. Uh, Lord and Catherine, yes, that, that is a, a question we could probably spend the rest of the board meeting on, so I probably will restrain my comments very briefly. Um, in, a, in a perfect universe, uh, in terms of things that we might want, you would, of course, you know, as a scientist, I'd want data about everything all of the time, and so I'd want, you know, to sequence every uh, bacteria I find on every source I can, um, and that is, you know, infinitely expensive. However, uh, I think a more reasonable approach uh, is sort of twofold. Firstly, there's a, there's a difference between data, sort of what we might call dry lab science, so computational data, versus wet lab where you actually have to do something. 
Um, so I think there is a lot we could achieve in terms of data uh, uh, access and sharing data, as I mentioned previously. Um, and I think that is something that is very much supported widely across government. And so we may, um, we will, I think, see over the coming months and years uh, an increased amount of data harvesting with useful uh, data for us emerging from all sorts of different positions. Uh, in terms of DNA technology, absolutely, this is a this is a field that is moving at incredible pace. Um, and this is actually one of the main planks of the bid that I mentioned that is currently under consideration with DEFRA and DHSC colleagues in genomic surveillance. Um, that would provide a, a really, uh, we think, internationally leading uh, sort of genomic insight into the evolution and the ecology of foodborne pathogens as they move from farm to fork. And I, I think that's really pioneering science. Um, you mentioned cost as a measure. So that, that bid is uh, just under £20 million. Uh, pounds, um, and uh, I think you know something of that scale can achieve really very, very significant science. Uh, of course, the, the, the final thing to say on that is the cost of DNA sequencing is falling incredibly fast uh, as new technologies become available. Um, and so uh, there is always this trade-off between you, you know, acting now or waiting six months and, and doing more for, for less money. Um, and I think we monitor very closely in terms of the impact and the, and the appropriate use of the science budget to get our maximum amount of data um, in terms of the investment we're making. So, so yes, there's a lot we can do and a lot we are planning to do, I think, there and, and hopefully um, some exciting things uh, in the months ahead. Thank you, Robin. And finally, Fiona? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Robin. Um, uh, it's a very impressive portfolio that you've got of science to cover, and I'm very much looking forward to getting involved um, in more detail um, going forward. Um, I've just got a very short question, which is to what extent do you get involved with industry science, scientists in the work that you do? Are they involved in our committees? Um, how do we engage them with the work that we're doing and those results? Because they're very good ambassadors um, to use them both to endorse their business operations, but also with their customer bases. And I think particularly with the international profile raising that we're looking to do more, um, you know, it's very helpful to have those people um, involved in what we're doing. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, so we do, we have uh, good industry representation on many of our scientific advisory committees um, with, of course, the caveat that they you know, sometimes have a conflict of interest that, that means they have to step out of the room for certain things. Um, but we really value their input and their expertise in that kind of uh, science. Um, in terms of engagement with science that is uh, industrially embedded, if you like, um, absolutely. Again, as with everything over the last 12 months, much less interaction than I would have liked in a in the perfect world. Um, but we are engaged quite regularly. The two things I would um, say are, so firstly, in terms of our, uh, particularly our behavioural consumer data, um, I know Michelle Patel, uh, who leads that, that team, is very closely engaged with uh, many uh, businesses in terms of uh, both sharing the data we have and, and helping use their data to guide our, our science. And that's a really productive and fruitful collaboration, which I think we will see more of. Um, and then lastly, on my side, uh, absolutely, I'm very keen to engage with those. And in fact, I have a, uh, a talk at Food and Drink Federation, I think the week, and possibly even next week, very soon, um, uh, in which I'm going to talk a bit about the kind of science that, that we see coming down the line and hear hopefully their thoughts on, on how we might be able to work more together. So, so yes, welcome. Essentially, you know, good quality science from all quarters is always very welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Robin. I don't see any more questions or comments, but um, I'm sure you can sense from the scale and breadth of, of the questions and comments you've received how much we value your clear and independent advice as our chief scientific advisor. So thank you very much indeed for a, a very successful first year. Um, thank you. And I particularly uh, just reinforce your comments about us working with the new organisational relationships with the UK Health Security Agency, but also the other functions from Public Health England and, and however they may be organised in future. And just to, just to uh, really un underline uh, the importance of those relationships. And obviously, of course, with the equivalent agencies in, in Wales and Northern Ireland, but uh, just welcome that close working. So I think it's important we, we are able to join up some of those elements as we go forward. Uh, but uh, excellent. Thank you very, very much indeed. And I'm sure you can sense we could we could carry on discussing many of these issues. I'm sure we'll re return to them uh, over the year ahead. But thank you very much, Robin. Thank you.
So um, we'll move on then to the next paper, which is Strategic Priorities for the Food Standards Agency Policy and Regulation. And uh, Rebecca Sibber. Rebecca. Thank you very much, Chair. So this paper gives a very broad overview of quite a wide range of different issues currently on our policy agenda. Uh, there's no decision required. It's, it's a citing paper, an opportunity to hear your early thoughts and steers, uh, and that will help us tailor our ongoing work uh, before we return to the board in more detail on, uh, on many of these issues, I'm sure. And uh, it's not just a, a list of topics, although I'm sure you'll be interested to explore some of them, but uh, we also wanted to illustrate how in policy directorate and across the agency, we're applying our guiding principles, really grounded in the science and evidence, leading the debate and working in collaboration with stakeholders to make a difference for consumers. Uh, and we highlight some of the ways in which we do that, uh, including, uh, as we were just discussing, a, a renewed focus on industry engagement as well as consumer engagement, uh, continuous improvement of the established regulatory regime and embedding our one agency and three and four country working in everything we do, which is very much in line with the approach that uh, the board has laid out for us. Um, of course, these aren't the only issues on our forward agenda, very far from it, but they are amongst some of the most important. Uh, but I'm also keen to hear if there are other things that you would like to hear more about. Uh, so I'm going to hand back to the chair now, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your views. Thank you very much indeed, Rebecca. Um, so open to uh, board members to comment on the scope of the paper and uh, any issues you wish to explore. Um, I think this is a really important opportunity for us to, to take an overview of uh, the issues uh, facing us and to help develop and inform our strategic uh, approach going forward. Any comments or questions? Lord Blencathra. You're on mute. Yes. Uh, as a new boy, I did not want to be first, but in the absence of anyone else jumping in, I shall. Rebecca, excellent paper. I have two questions for you and one comment. Perhaps if I give them to you one at a time, if I may. I, I warmly welcome the paper, but I, and I feel it's almost all there. However, I do respectfully suggest that one of the greatest food and health challenges the nation is facing at the moment is obesity, and that's missing. Now, I accept we're not in charge of, of nutrition policy in England, uh, nor labelling, but I believe that the type of food, the amount of food, and where we get it from is a food safety issue, uh, in my opinion. It may also fall under a remit of food we can trust, and, and we cannot trust some of it to provide us with healthy diets. Now, it may not have bacteria in it, but it is making us unhealthy, and it's simply killing us over a much longer time span. Can we therefore look at this again? And even with the limited levers of power which we have, can we try and pull them at the moment and make this a strategic priority? That's my first question. Rebecca? Thank you. Uh, that, that, that is a, a, a very uh, important issue. You're absolutely right and a huge strategic question. Um, I think that's one that I might uh, ask our chair and our chief exec to respond on first. Uh, but just going, uh, just going back to uh, some of the things we were discussing in the previous item, it's it's always our view that uh, as the Food Standards Agency, you know, we're here to represent the interests of consumers. Uh, and we can do that in a number of ways, and bringing our expertise and our evidence to bear, working in partnership across government, is always one of the ways in which we look to do that. So. Um, of course, we work in partnership with colleagues across government, but I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, our chief exec come in for a moment. Uh, and then also my colleague Maria may want to talk a little, a little bit more because we do have specific responsibility for nutrition in respect of uh, Northern Ireland. Emily. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Um, so, uh, David, thanks for the comment. Um, and it's uh, so a couple of things to say. The first is that what you're describing is quite a strategic shift for the FSA. Um, and it's, um, although other than some, uh, the, our responsibility for nutrition policy in Northern Ireland, it's not the major feature of what we do at the moment. Um, we have an opportunity over the next few months to look at the strategy of the FSA and with an incoming chair, um, I'm hoping that will be one of our first activities. Uh, so I hope in the course of uh, the autumn and then 
towards the winter, we will be bringing a strategy to the board for consideration. So I think that's the place for us to consider. Um, the second thing is there are there are a couple of areas where right now we do look at the question of nutrition and obesity that I just wanted to mention that they're small, but I think they are significant. The first is in relation to the novel foods and regulated products process, which Rebecca is actually responsible for, where um, along with looking at the food safety aspects of a regulated product application, we also look at, quote, other consumer interests in that uh, product. And I would expect that we would want to bring that weighing up of um, the different short term and long term food safety questions, as you're describing. So it, it is we do have the ability under that policy to bring that in. Um, the second is uh, when we come to later today, um, we'll talk about the annual report on food standards, which yeah. we want to do with Food Standards Scotland. And Food Standards Scotland are responsible for nutrition and we're responsible for it in yeah. Northern Ireland. So I would expect that to be a more comprehensive description of um, a state of the nation of food standards for the UK. And the thing I have in mind is that in 2010, the FSA had nutrition policy taken off yeah. it and therefore funding taken off given to the Department of Health and Public Health England. So it's, 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 uh, it, it does mean we have a complex landscape of responsibilities. Okay. Thank you. Um, Maria, did you want to say anything about Northern Ireland nutrition? Please, Ruth, that would be lovely. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is important to, to describe the role that the FSA plays in relation to nutrition in Northern Ireland. Um, the FSA, with, with many other partners across government in Northern Ireland, um, plays its part in delivering um, the 10-year obesity prevention strategy that we have in place. And within that strategy, there are about 70 outcomes identified that are measured. Um, but the FSA only leads on a small number of those outcomes. We support um, our, our, our government partners to deliver on many more of them. But the ones that we lead on are the ones that we are uniquely placed to deliver. And that is around the discussions that we have with the food industry, encouraging them and supporting them to reformulate in the manufacturing world, and then also providing advice and guidance to caterers to make sure that they provide healthier choices and also that they reduce portion size. We also want caterers to display calories on menus, and we have a system in place to do that. And also then um, we, we lead on food labelling, including nutrition labelling and front of pack signpost labelling as well. So that's the role that the FSA plays in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think you, there's, yeah. there's a discussion to be had. We're clearly yeah. responsible for obesity policy in its entirety. However, we do have an opportunity to contribute where we can yeah. uh, and support other agencies. And uh, as Emily said, I'm sure we'll be having further discussion about yeah. um, the clarity of our scope, but also recognising what we're resolved to do uh, in that context. So, um, Lord yeah. Brent, I think you had other questions. Yes, I, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. And I, I'm grateful for the response to that. I'm, I'm partly sorry for raising it at the moment, but if we're going to have a proper detailed discussion and a strategy look at it, I am content. I may raise something similar under our, our article on the annual report on food standards with Scotland. My second brief question to uh, uh, Rebecca is that um, the next item on the agenda is horizon scanning. And that suggests a big increase or the continuing growth of online food purchasing of all sorts. Can we give urgent consideration as to how labeling for online food purchasing can catch up? Since I know when I go around the supermarkets, I can pick up packets and the, red, the traffic light system stands out. If I buy food from supermarkets online, it's just almost invisible. And of course, if one buys um, uh, online uh, takeaway food, it's non-existent. So can we also give thought to how our online food purchasing can be properly labeled? That may be part of the DEFRA Department of Health discussions in future as well. If you want to comment on that, I'll take some more. Yeah, I can, I can comment on that. And, uh, and again, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The rise of uh, online and distant selling and uh, different ways of purchasing food is uh, something we're very interested in. Um, obviously, I, you know, all food businesses have to provide the relevant information about the food, what's in it. Uh, including uh, um, the allergen information. Uh, there are different ways in which they can do that, uh, depending on the kind of business 
but the requirement to make that information available is very, very clear. Uh, and we, we provide a lot of advice and guidance for businesses about how best they can do that. Uh, and labels can be a really important part of that. And, uh, and we encourage businesses to use those. So uh, you're absolutely right. It is, it's an issue that we're continuing to explore. Um, and there are upcoming changes to labelling, as, as you're very well aware. So we have the uh, pre pack for direct sale allergen labelling regulations coming in this autumn, uh, working with businesses to, to help them to implement that effectively. So uh, that consumers have access to information in lots of different ways. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we need to be sure of is uh, the evidence about the best way in which they should receive that information. So it's absolutely very uh, live area for us to keep an eye on. And thank you for raising it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. My, my final point. Um, could I just raise a little note of caution on sustainable animal production? There's a lot of comments out there that if we cut back livestock herds in the UK, we save the planet. Well, we don't necessarily save the planet if we import beef and pork and lamb from, from uh, other systems which are less sustainable uh, on our own. And we could damage nature in our countryside if we cut it back inappropriately. And personally, I don't see anything how it saves the planet if we're cutting down the rainforest to import soya milk. No need to comment on it. That's just an observation I wish to flag up. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you for the observation. Um, Tim. Yes, uh, thank, thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Ben Kaffer. I think uh, I declare my interest as a livestock farmer and support that. But I think more specifically to the to the report, I was very interested, uh, and thank you, Rebecca, for setting out the report so clearly, um, as to how we can use some of the very innovative approaches we're taking uh, as a regulator um, to think how when we work in partnership, we can act as an exemplar that others can benefit from. And, and let me just put some flesh on the bones on that. So we do work on the cost of illness model, which I think is a fab fabulous approach, but very much focused in around um, the costs and benefits of what we do around foodborne pathogens. But uh, consistent with some of the observations already made this morning, we know that actually in the processing of food, uh, it's not just safety, but wider quality determinants that also become important in the regulatory role that we have. And we, we know that, and I won't repeat the discussion that we've had about where those responsibilities lie in, in, in what parts of the UK, but I think we have a voice wherever we are in the UK to comment on that. So I'm interested to understand where we might uh, extend that methodology um, and as I mentioned in the earlier item particularly around uh, when working with DEFRA and working with the Department of Health on both social and environmental aspects because actually when we are presenting information to consumers I think there is an increased interest particularly uh, in the light of change practices during COVID in those topics and I think this is particularly brought brought to bear around um, some novel foods, particularly ultra-processed foods, where I think they're starting to gain uh, certainly notice amongst the media and the public, but also questions that we may actually play a part in addressing. But I think we can only do that in collaboration. Um, and I think we can do that best by showing what we do well in this area. Thanks. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to comment briefly and just conscious we... Yes, really briefly. Uh, yeah, so um, absolutely. And I, I completely agree that uh, as we move forward and think about the regulatory regime we want to have in future, we need to make sure that we're joining up uh, again across government. I know uh, it's a common theme here, but it really, it really is important. And um, uh, you know, as, uh, as food regulators, we already do that. Uh, you know, in all kinds of ways. I think uh, the work that Robin uh, mentioned earlier on uh, antimicrobial resistance is a really good example of that. Yeah. Um, in terms of our regulatory work on CBD, for example, uh, you know, we've had to pay close attention to the boundaries with other regulatory regimes around uh, healthcare products and medicines, for example. So I, I think these are really important questions. Uh, ultra processed foods themselves are not a, a category regulated in law. This is um, uh, I know I know the term has been around for a decade or more, but it's still, uh, I think, uh, an evolving concept. 
Um, but you, know, you mentioned the novel foods regime, and obviously one of the characteristics of uh, ultra-processed foods is that uh, they can sometimes um, require the addition of uh, um, substances and chemicals as part of the ingredient. So for food additives, obviously, we have a very clear regulatory role to play there. Um, and uh, another aspect of the novel foods regime is that, um, in general, when a food is uh, designed to replace um, a, a food already on the market, uh, the novel food should not have uh, lower nutritional characteristics. So there are some things that we can take into account. And, uh, and of course, we do so. But that's a very broad question. And yes, uh, very important uh, for us to take into account when we move forward. Um, I think you were asking maybe a sp more specific question about the cost of illness model and whether there are other costs that can be taken into account. Uh, and I will uh, take that away and discuss that with said colleagues uh, who obviously are very welcome to, to comment now if they'd like to as well. Okay, I think we'll we'll press on. Margaret's next. Um, thanks, Ruth, and um, thank you, Rebecca. Love strategic papers. Um, uh, just a, a reflection on what we've had, uh, what's gone before on obesity. Would there be any merit in um, producing a simple paper that might identify where we could, under our remit, feed more strongly into the cross-government obesity agenda. Um, not, a, not a list of what we can do, but what a list of what we could do, maybe a little bit of thought in that, and maybe that would help. For example, I'm thinking about, you know, um, the work we do on, or we're, we're planning to do on food security and um, lower income people and the way that they can access food or on labeling. Um, on the uh, labeling discussion, online labeling, uh, the issue also applies to allergen labeling. I know that. Um, and then you ask uh, about the paper, what's missing? I've mentioned before, but I won't let it go, is the government, and we fed strongly into the government's paper a couple of years ago on folic acid and that hasn't yet been um, published and I just wondered how much pressure we could put on um, seeing that move forward. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, one of the biggest challenges um, that we've got at the moment <coughs> is fulfilling government policy on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And um, we all know and government knows that it is a bit of a square peg trying to get into a round hole. And I just wondered how much uh, merit there might be in trying to do some um, out of the box thinking on how we can help somehow um, ease this problem. And it may not necessarily be just us, it may be much more cross government thinking to make a difference um, on this big problem. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, wide range of issues there, Rebecca. Again, um, brief comments on them. Yeah, much of this will feed into our strategic discussions. It going will, forward. yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, yeah, and I was going to say, Margaret. Yes, I think your suggestion on you know uh, thinking and and setting out uh, what we can do on obesity and where we might do is, I think, very much for that strategic uh, conversation. Um, yes, thank you. And uh, you know the issue of allergen information uh, again. We can maybe come on to that when we talk about food hypersensitivity. But that's something that we're very aware of. Uh, and again, we focus particularly on providing information for um, uh, takeaways and uh, businesses uh, who are uh, selling online. Um, and a uh, question on folic acid, I, uh, I might ask my colleague Maria if she has any comments on that one, because uh, that's not something I'm familiar with. Um, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, I think uh, one of the things we absolutely can do as, as, as a food regulator is to make sure that we're um, a, a absolutely as clear as we can be to uh, businesses and consumers about what this means, uh, what businesses need to do, what consumers can expect. Uh, and we're certainly we're certainly doing that. Um, and also, as I think um, uh, is identified in the paper, working really closely across government, particularly with DEFRA uh, and also um, with colleagues in cabinet office uh, to, you know, just just again, to make sure that all parts of government are working together and that we're involved uh, in all of the right discussions. Uh, and Maria and colleagues as well are uh, providing a lot of input and support to our local authority um, delivery partners in Northern Ireland who, uh, along, along with others, have responsibility for making 
making sure that these uh, that these new arrangements are working in practice. So, so we we are already doing all we can. But I, again, I'll take that challenge to to do some out of the box thinking, and uh, uh, and we're always open to new ideas. Um, Maria, do you want to? provide a quick update on folic acid or we could do a note to the board afterwards but anything yes, yes Ruth really quickly Margaret you'll be pleased to hear that we now have four country support for um mandating folic acid um, and I think the difficulty has been just um, the time um, to, to get the legislation through. So health departments are working um, hard to, to move it on um, and I think we'll see a lot of progress this year. Thank you very much, Maria. So uh, we have two more uh, questions, uh, Fiona and then Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Rebecca, just uh, two comments really from me. Um, uh, the, the, I support what the, other chair, what the other board members have said about being keen to see a, a clear strategy on what we do around food insecurity, obesity, the general health territory that we have uncharted responsibility for. Um, I think it could be quite a challenge, but um, you know, it's something obviously we're going to have to address. Um, and then I think um, it was just a, a, a small comment on the draft guiding principles. Um, clearly, there's a great deal of strategic work to be done, putting in place how we're going to be structured and operate for the future, particularly with reference to the industry. I think that there's just some language here which could be misleading if you're looking to make it easy for businesses to maintain food standards. Does that imply that they're going to be less robust? Um, so it's just a, a small thing we perhaps should be con con consider as we develop the plans. Thank you, Fiona. Peter, should we take your comments to the question? very supportive of the paper and strategy going forward uh, but also supportive of the comments that have been made about nutrition and obesity and it links with a point that was made during the discussion in the Welsh Advisory Committee where uh, people picked up on the use of the phrase food standards and food safety as if they were two things, two separate things, linked but separate. And if one uses the term simply food standards, it underlines the scope, the broader scope, which encompasses, therefore, things like uh, uh, nutrition, although we haven't got the brief as such. Nevertheless, it is linked so closely, we ought to be pushing the boundary until we can take over that, uh, be awarded again what was taken away in 2010. And I think there is strong support for that kind of move. Uh, and the terminology just helps to form the bridge into a, a, a wider brief. So Rebecca, final word to you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take those uh, those last as comments, if that's all right. And uh, and yes, Peter, it's, it's always useful just to reflect on the language we use and making sure that we're precise. Um, and uh, just to say thank you very much. I, I really welcome your support. Uh, we've uh, had a really uh, wide ranging discussion. Uh, I've got a number of specific things to take away and think about and some priorities you've identified. And I think uh, uh, the, the FSA as a whole has some uh, interesting uh, ideas to take into our future strategy discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca, for your comments. Uh, and, Margaret, uh, I don't want to oh, Sorry, Margaret. Thank you. I just want to um, make it really clear that when I suggested we do a bit of work on what we can do, it would be much more to feed into the wider government agenda. I think those are the words I do because I don't, I'm not aware of the FSA having any policy to try and lobby to bring everything back. Um, it was done in a knee jerk reaction a long time ago because I happened to be on the board, this very board at that time. And yes, we fought it terribly because it, we didn't feel logical. But, you know, you need to do an awful lot of work before we start m mixing government structures and 
trying to take it back. So I think it's a case of starting, you know, to see whether we can actually have impact, but without treading on other government departments, but feeding into them was my personal view. We'll take that away and uh, reflect on that. Uh, I think your suggestion of having a paper just sets out what where the boundaries are and um, what we could be doing or should be doing uh, and how we feed into that wider debate, I think is helpful for us to clarify exactly that point. Yeah, and what um, more we could be doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure that will feed into our strategic developments over the next uh, few months. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, Rebecca and the team for the work on that. We were asked to comment on the issues raised in the paper. I think we have. Um, and to consider and comment how it might wish to be engaged. And I think you can see clear evidence that we want to be actively engaged and uh, we look forward to further strategic discussions uh, going forward in the, over the rest of this year. So thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm going to move us on um, to the next paper and hopefully welcome uh, Michelle Patel, Head of Social Science to the table. There we are, Michelle. Um, and you're going to present the paper on Horizon Scanning, the annual update. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, so I will uh, jog through these slides extremely quickly because there's a lot here and I'm keen to take the, the questions um, and comments from the board. Um, could we move the slide on, please? Oh, it works. <laughs> I can do it myself. Um, so this is um, really in response to a couple of things. In 2019, the Science Council uh, made some good recommendations about how we could improve our foresight capability, drawing on a range of what we would call signals from across the, the system and our own system to uh, provide better anticipatory um, insights into what's coming next. This was really uh, focused on far more and accelerated during the pandemic last year, um, where really preparing for the unexpected over the past few years has, has come to the fore. So the board last time saw our snapshot of our work last August, which had been to predominantly respond to the pandemic. It shortened our horizons, but it really helped us work, work across the organisation and bring together a small and agile capability to try and anticipate the challenges that were going to be coming up in the coming at the time weeks. Since then, we've been working really hard to um, broaden out our scope. So we're looking at a much wider range of potential emerging issues and opportunities, but also uh, build the capacity and think a little bit further ahead into the future. Now, for some reason, it's not letting me move the slides on. Perhaps it was a, a coincidence, yes. So this is something that all government departments are being strongly encouraged to do. And there are a range of pretty well-established techniques out there, come from uh, the corporate world and also the defence world with which to do it. So we have been applying some of these in the past six months, um, a very uh, wide ranging view, because we have to keep our ears open to weak signals and perhaps disrupt some of the assumptions that we may have ourselves about what the future might hold. Next slide, please. So um, the, the the trick with this is not to stick to one method. It's it's about uh, keeping a range of perspectives and then triangulating where you get to from the range of evidence that uh, that you discover. And the picture is building. Next slide, please. But it's only really worth having if you can do something about it. And so so um, we're really keen to e emphasise that we're drawing on a really wide range of inputs here, but it gets synthesized and sense made of it through um, an iterative process. And it, this is a shared function between the science team and the strategy team. And we now have uh, a building process to understand which insights are material and which are close and which need to be acted on um, and a, a function by whereas that goes up to the executive on a regular basis and then decisions are taken on whether to implement change, ask for more evidence or, or um, respond and, and take a, a different stance perhaps than the current one. And that's a, a, a process that's building. We have some early wins. I think it's important to say it's still early days and we're very much looking forward to coming back to the board with a fuller picture, uh, an even broader perspective, uh, a, a look further out and, um, and feeding in to the upcoming strategic discussions, as well as working with colleagues across government uh, 
uh, to share evidence on what is essentially a systemic uh, look. So conscious of time, I will stop there because I think we have, we, we, we've got lots of uh, fruitful ground for questions, I'm sure. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Um, so if we could stop the screen sharing. Thank you. Um, so um, over to board members, any comments, questions for Michelle? Margaret. On mute. There seems to be a reluctance to go first today. <laughs> <laughs> it's all really interesting. Um, do you want me to comment overall on um, the paper from beginning to end? Just make my list of comments. Is that the best way? Yes. Um, yeah. I, I thought it was um, absolutely fascinating. Totally agree with um, most of um, what, what you're suggesting. And um, I think the short term work on ca capturing the positives from COVID um, is extremely important. Yeah and hopefully will, will make us more intelligence-led um, and will also help with our modernising regulation work um, uh, as well. Um, I just think there are some areas which I wonder if we're doing enough to um, uh, help the public with. Um, things like GM technology, which are in the news at the moment, and that comes up more in the Cambridge paper, but it, it's a horizon scanning issue. And I just wondered how much it had moved on in the last 20 years. Um, you know, um, is it much safer? Is it less unpredictable, etc.? And also, I was fascinated in the Cambridge report to note that cultured meat contains fewer nutrients than real meat. Um, I hadn't sort of taken that on. And... Um, uh, you know, again, is it something we should be aware of um, to stop us going down certain avenues in the future that perhaps we shouldn't be? Um, and then I think um, thinking about anticipating uh, rather than reacting to things, regulation tends to be behind. How can we ensure that next time we have the chance of opening up the law, that we um, make sure the law is worded in a way that will cover things that we may not have anticipated in the future. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I, I'm wondering whether Robin wants to pick up issues about GM and cultured. Yeah, I brought them up in his paper. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That, that's, yes, I'm happy to comment now if that's all right. Really, I, I was trying to find the raise hand function and doing a bad job of it. So I'm glad you read my mind. Um, yeah, so I, I totally agree, Margaret. I think that um, there is a lot we can do and already do do in terms of uh, sort of getting across complicated science food issues to, to consumers in particular. Um, and GM and the related genome editing technology is, is a key area. We have done some. So we have done, there is an FSA explains video that's on our web page there, um, there are some downloadable resources for people to understand more about the difference there um, as you will know in that particular example uh, this has been a defra led consultation about um, gm and g technologies uh, they will formally respond in the coming months and i think that on the back of that response we will then probably uh, do a second tranche of uh, engagement with consumers and businesses to ensure that people understand the underlying science. Clearly, as a regulator, we need to hold a position of um, clear objectivity here. It's about explaining the facts of the situation, not suggesting one thing or another. Um, but I think there's a lot we can do there. And I think going further ahead, I would envisage us doing something similar. For instance, if in the future lab-grown meat um, goes through the uh, approvals process and reaches the market in the UK, I think we would also want to be doing something similar there to explain what it is so that people clearly understand uh, you know and they can make an informed decision about what they do or do not want to buy and and we ought to be also because we do labeling things be thinking about it's the old thing of you know is it meat or is it not meat is vegan cheese cheese etc labeling and, and titles Yes, and I know, I mean, we have done, uh, in terms of consumer uh, uh, sort of feedback, I know we're doing a lot about um, uh, understanding what people would or would not want to see on a label, and what's important to them. And I think that feeds into the labelling discussions that we that we are holding, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Rebecca, did you want, thank you, Robin, did you want to comment on, on Margaret's points? Or is it a separate yeah. point? No, these points, yeah, just to say that in, uh, in, you mentioned the regulatory regime and, uh, you know, linking back to the last paper, making sure that our regime is fit for purpose and can deal adequately with uh, regulatory questions of the future is something we're, we, we, we really want to do. That, 
that, that's one of the things that uh, we mean by continuous improvement is making sure that we're continually anticipating how the regime should work. And I think our, um, our approach to uh, uh, gene editing is a good example of that, where, you know, we're thinking very carefully and working with DEFRA to, um, uh, to, 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 you know, establish what, what a future regulatory regime may look like if the government decides that they want to um, to change the way that gene editing is treated. And obviously that is uh, still um, subject to uh, consultation and the outcome of that consultation. So uh, so it's very important and we do we are thinking very actively about that. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Michelle, do you want to add anything? I've, I've got Tim wanting to come in next. I will very quickly, if, if that's all right. On the other side of the, of the forest, as it were, in social science, we've just um, completed a piece of work to understand consumer acceptance and understanding of um, gene editing and, and GM. And that is going to be published alongside when the DEFRA consultation uh, happens. So we're looking to publish that in the summer. Um, so we are, that's almost come from future into, into very close to, to now. So we, we are actively looking at that one. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Tim. Thank you. And I, I thought this was an excellent paper. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. I, I particularly enjoyed reading the rapid evidence assessment from Cambridge. Um, and I saw great value in it because I think it underscored our role as a, an objective regulator um, and getting evidence and information out to uh, the public as well. Obviously, these, these papers are public, but it did seem to me that... Um, having a transparent process and one of the lovely things about the FSA is uh, in the way we do our boards and the way we do our business we're very transparent getting some of that objectivity into the public domain has a great value in its own right um, and it just occurred to me that uh, there may be value and I heard what you said around the GE uh, gene editing issue but actually in some of the other topics covered as well it seemed to me there was value in thinking how we could produce some of what's in that paper in an even more publicly accessible way um, as we go through our messaging in the days to come. Thanks very much, Tim. Rebecca, you have a hand up. Is that from before? Okay, thanks. Uh, any other comments from board members before I go back to Michelle? No? Okay. Uh, Michelle, final comments from you. Thank you very much. Um, and just to respond to Tim, yes, I'm a, a science communicator at heart. I, I would uh, be very keen to get some of this stuff out um, and engaged more widely. It's very early days, it's a very small team, but we're building on this. Thank you. Um, I think you can see that the board's very interested and um, appreciative of the work that you've done so far to set this whole function capability up. Um, and, and I think what it's really helpful to see is that it's starting to uh, turn into practical actions uh, for the short, medium, long-term thinking. So that's really helpful. I see Rick wants to come in. Rick, do you want to comment? Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to, to, to add on to Michelle's point about how we've been building this and just say that uh, obviously recognising the important work the Science Council did in their working group three paper, which which kind of set us on this path. So I just wanted to, to uh, put that point up there and make it uh, on, put it on the record. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I was just thinking also on the Cambridge report. Um, I mean, there's, there are a number of recommendations uh, on page three of the report. Um, and I'm wondering whether we could come back and, and have a, a formal response from the executive on uh, their observations on those recommendations as part of the work going forward. And that'd be helpful, I think, to reflect uh, on those specifics. Um, so I think there aren't any further comments. Um, we're asked to note the overall strategic assessment. Um, we note the necessary work. And also, I think we appreciate that it's starting to prove its worth. Um, confirm our support uh, for the activity. And we've touched on areas we'd like to see more uh, exploration uh, with regard to certain topics. So. I think just to say thank you very much indeed, Michelle and the team for the work that you're doing. And um, I think it really is helping us to um, really be strategic in our approach. Um, so I think we've finished uh, that item. We are running a little bit late. Um, so I think we're due for a break just now. And I think we probably would benefit from one. There's a long agenda today. I've noticed that Colm's just joined us. Colm, you've just arrived in, welcome. Uh, just in, arrived in, term for, for, in time for a 10 minute break. Um, so it's 10.15 now. I propose we come back at 10.
Well, welcome back. Um, we're going to move on now to the FSA annual report on risk assessments. And uh, a pleasure to welcome Amy Adkin, Head of Risk Assessment, to the meeting. Uh, and then invite uh, Rick Mumford, Deputy Director of Science, Evidence and Research, to um, introduce the paper. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Chair. Yes. So, as you said, um, this is the annual review on risk assessment, and this follows on from uh, two papers that were presented in 2020 that focused on the other pillars of our risk assessment analysis process. So, they focused on risk management and risk communication. Um, I think what's different about this paper is obviously it's been presented after EU exit. So not only does it uh, present a picture of what we did in preparation uh, for, for the 1st of January, but it also um, presents what we've done over the last six months. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, very much a paper about um, uh, letting the board understand um, what we've done and providing assurance that we, we have the, the capability and capacity in place to, to deal with the risk assessment part of risk analysis process. Um, I won't say any more, but I'll hand over to Dr. Amy Atkin, who's our, as you said, Head of Risk Assessment Unit at the FSA. Thanks, Amy. Lovely. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, I'm not going to go through the paper point by point, uh, but make some key highlights uh, for this stop take. Um, just to say that this report is only on risk assessment, so a component within the risk analysis um, uh, pathway uh, where we estimate the risk. So this report does not cover the whole of the risk analysis process, which would, of course, include the risk management functions, uh, nor any of our other technical work um, that we complete. So um, we're six months now um, post-transition. Um, we now have our first piece of new repatriated work, which we've now started. Um, and this paper shows how we're still building the required um, capacity and capability, um, and also indicates how, um, how with other, other government departments in risk assessment, our processes are aligning, and what we've prioritised um, to look for in the short term over the sort of next six months before we have another review. So we've implemented significant structural and procedural changes to prepare for this time, including a functional separation of FSA staff between risk assessment and risk management roles and the creation of the risk assessment unit. So we had a starting count of about 20 risk assessors and we've now got a head count of approximately 65. And this has been accompanied by intensive internal and external training programmes uh, for successive cohorts. Um, various production of internal guidance and a greater emphasis on harmonising FSA risk assessment report formats between staff and teams. We've got two fellows also being recruited for our unit, um, as mentioned by Robin May, to help us innovate risk assessment for genomics and computational toxicology. The challenge we've had is the recruitment of suitably trained toxicologists, where we're pursuing different options for a longer term solution. So what type of uh, work have we got throwing, flowing through our processes at the moment? Well, for the assessments to support risk-based standards and controls, and this is formally our business as usual work, we've had four pieces commissioned since January, of which two we might have completed more informally if we were still in the EU. For regulated products, a repatriated service, there's lots of different facts and figures. Um, of over 1,000 applications, over 400 have had sufficient information to start validation, and 18 are actively in the assessment stage. And it's been really great to see these processes, which we spent years building, now being used for real. Um, in terms of volume, applications are broadly in line with what we estimated pre-transition, with the exception of the workload for CBD applications, which was much higher than expected. For third country market access, this is a repatriated function for DEFRA UK office. We now provide the public health um, food and feed risk assessment function. And here we continue to address the challenges of implementing new processes coordinated by DEFRA across government to ensure it's embedded and fully functional. We've got two food and feed import risk assessments that have been commissioned by DEFRA and both are to support decisions in transferring statutory instruments. And we've had one commissioned by FSA under the hygiene regulations for Japanese imports. In terms of other government um, departments processes to risk assessment, we're feeding into um, different mechanisms within the veterinary medicines directorate and working on the nutrition labelling composition standards framework with DHSC, FSS and Welsh government. It must be remembered our primary purpose is the time provision of rapid risk assessments for incidents for food and feed, including those for COVID-19, all the subsequent challenges from EU exit. We delivered over 100 in six months and ensured that this service has not been affected by the additional work streams. 
Essential to all these processes is the role of the scientific advisory committees, as outlined by Robin May earlier. Um, we've strengthened their number and in the last 12 months supported over 40 SACOR expert group meetings. And these groups have also been working hard to provide that independent expert judgment to the FSA and are part of our key assurance mechanisms. One challenge here has been the need to reconstitute ACAF, the Advisory Committee on Animal Feeding Stuffs, as a risk assessment only SAC. And we're working with DEFRA to see how ownership of this committee can be fully handed back to the FSA. So that was a short roundup. In summary of our key areas of focus for the next six months, um, further training to address the volume of applications submitted to the Regulated Product Service, taking these first applications through our new systems and working with the um, SACs to refine our working practices and ensuring there is sufficient capacity for feed additives via ACAF or a suitable alternative committee. We continue to contribute uh, on information exchange with the EU in respect to Northern Ireland to ensure the FSA has sufficient access to data for non-routine risk analysis issues. And finally, um, we will carry out a review um, in six months' time, so we'll have a full review of the 12 months of operation to identify any process improvements or inform any further planning on capacity and capability needed um, to meet this function. So that sort of summarises our report. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, on the whistle stop tour of uh, progress on risk assessment. The paper uh, gives us an opportunity to seek assurance uh, on how uh, the plans we put in place have been executed and, and developed in the first six months of, of the system, uh, and also highlights, I think, areas where we need uh, to focus on ongoing development. So thank you very much indeed for the work you've done to get us to this point, um, both you and Rick and the team. So questions, Tim, and then Mark. My, mine is very quick. Uh, great, great paper and great presentation. Thank you very much indeed. And I think covering a lot of very important issues in terms of what is going to present us uh, to, to us in the future. Um, I'm very pleased with also hearing about ACAF as a former member, um, and particularly given the uh, provenance of the FSA, uh, because clearly uh, the issue around animal feed continues to be, I think, a big concern. And with different trade agreements coming into place, uh, I think it's important also we think about the sourcing of those, uh, the ingredients that go into animal feed. Um, so I think, uh, you know, just wanted to say well done. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's hope this uh, continues. Um, and uh, I'd very much like to see where we go in the future with it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Mark? Uh, thank you, Ruth. And yeah, just to echo that, this is very impressive, and it, you know, it's a it's it's a good and positive position to be in. I think I do have a couple of quick questions. They're they're relatively small points, but um, you mentioned that it's in the report as well about the the difficulty with recruiting uh, toxicologists. Uh, I can understand that. I employ toxicologists in my own place of work. Um, what I'm interested to know is. You said you've mentioned some 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 ideas around some long term solutions, but what's the short to medium term impact of not having those uh, people in in place? Are we are we opening ourselves to uh, a higher risk of not being able to do this job properly because of this difficulty? Uh, that's my first question. The second question is around uh, regulated products and the risk assessment there. Um, obviously, that's a new new process, and it's good to see that it's it's making a good start. Um, I suppose what I'm looking for there is a little bit of reassurance that we've got the right processes and the right resources uh, so that we, government in effect, are not the blocker to business innovation. We've got sufficient capacity to actually deal with, with the work that's coming through. Thank you. Amy? Thank you very much. Um, if I can take the, the first question first. Um, so in terms of our short term um, requirements for toxicologists, it, it has involved us um, having more than one round of recruitment. So we did a very large campaign, which started in February, and unfortunately we were too short of our total. Um, and so we are currently recruiting again for another two posts, but we've pretty much um, exhausted all of our areas in which we would ordinarily resource our toxicologists from. So in the future, um, we're having to plan for um, more in-house training. So taking people on who have uh, chemistry or biochemistry and then completing some of the own in-house uh, training ourselves. But we're facing the difficulty that so many external courses have closed over the last few years. And it's about having those discussions because 
the FSA, we're too small to actually put on apprenticeships or schemes of our own. And so we're trying to join up across government and talking to academia and to industry about potentially putting in uh, more of a joint uh, campaign for, for funding for some of those courses, um, because it's, it's not just the FSA, as you said, that's, um, that's suffering from this shortage. Thanks, Amy. Um, Margaret. Thank you, and again, really interesting paper and uh, very clear. Um, I, I just um, want to point out there was a question, wasn't there, at the beginning about the numbers of novel applications, and you slightly touched on it, but it was a question from a member of the public. Um, and I guess that was relating to Canada Doyle, and do we need to, um, to ask you a little bit more about that? And then on the Northern Ireland Protocol, and I'm probably being really thick here, and I know I keep bringing it up, but um, I can see under the protocol that Northern Ireland businesses are relying on EFSA and EC risk analysis. Um, but um, where there are problems for businesses elsewhere, in the UK trying to export or send their goods to Northern Ireland, how do they fit into the process? Um, so um, in terms of any incidents raised, so obviously our function is just looking at risk assessment, so assessing the risk of certain things happening. So um, we wait until we're commissioned, uh, so there's a problem identified, and we've made sure we have the continued capacity to deal with those incidents. So whilst we've had a reduction perhaps in the more traditional incidents we have due to people not washing their hands, for example, we've had an increase in um, the incidents raised by um, EU exit processes. And in those cases, we, we will join those incidents and provide risk assessment um, capacity in that, in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, Rebecca, did you want to come in in response to the regulated products question? I can, yes. So, uh, so yes. Thank you, Margaret. I can um, I can uh, provide a bit of information in relation to the question that we had. Uh, so, I think um, actually, since um, uh, the figure of uh, eighteen that Amy mentioned, which is the one we published in our last board meeting in our chief exec's report, I think we now have up to twenty eight products across all regimes that have been validated and are now um, beginning the the. Um, risk assessment process. That's obviously not the same as authorised. That's very different. Uh, and uh, I think our questioner was a representative of the uh, CBD industry or had an interest in that. Uh, four of those uh, are CBD products which have been validated. Um, all of this information is on the FSA website. Uh, and those validated CBD products are, are linked to a very much larger number of uh, retail products. Uh, so um, all of that information is available on the FSA website and we are updating that as new products are, as new CBD products are validated uh, in line with our policy. Um, and uh, just in relation to the regulated product service, uh, Mark, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's very important that um, we meet our commitments to, to um, uh, uh, deliver this process in a timely way so that we're not a barrier to, uh, to innovation. Um, in future, we're going to be providing um, updates on the performance of the regulated products process uh, in our reports to the business committee. Uh, so um, you'll be able to see um, how things are progressing. Thank you, Rebecca. Colm. Welcome. Sure, thank you and apologies for, for uh, a little lateness this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm, many of my questions have already been touched on, but just if I can ask a specific one, Amy, on the, on the protocol, on the Northern Ireland Protocol and, and the operation of that, and really in relation to uh, our relationship with, with EFSA, uh, and obviously who are doing the risk analysis given the Northern Ireland specific position, how do we, how do we keep up, up to speed with exactly what's going on with EFSA in terms of their risk analysis? And do we have a plan? Should we have a situation where there's a differential between the, their view of risk analysis and our view of risk analysis as concerns the Northern Ireland consumer? Uh, and what, what happens if our risk analysis on a four-country model differs from what EFSA say? How do we manage that? I can see that Rebecca's got her hand up, so um, uh, I hand over to Rebecca first. Yeah, uh, so we've had a few questions about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, so firstly, going back to Margaret's point about uh, the, the way in which um, uh, goods sort of flow, flow in the United Kingdom, etc. So obviously, under the terms of the Internal Market Act, uh, anything that's lawfully on, on sale in one part of the United Kingdom can be placed on the market in another, including in Northern Ireland. Obviously, the difference is that uh, nothing can um, uh, 
then um, go into the European Union that does not meet their standards. Uh, however, obviously, we're starting from a position of regulatory alignment, uh, although, as we've discussed uh, on many occasions before, there will be now regulatory divergence over time. Um, but, you know, this is what the, um, the UK Internal Market Act uh, is designed to, um, to safeguard. Uh, in terms of how we keep an eye on what's happening in the European Union, obviously um, it's very important that we know what's coming out of Europe because, uh, as, as we've uh, said, uh, in Northern Ireland they will be following those regulations. Uh, so we have mechanisms in place to uh, track and anticipate what those uh, what those issues are that, that are going through the regulatory process. And in um, in many cases, uh, um, uh, we um, uh, in, in common with uh, with other external stakeholders uh, may have access to some of the, uh, the, the evidence packages. Uh, in other cases, it's uh, commercial and in confidence and, and we wouldn't necessarily do so. Um, but as Colm has pointed out, we've been very clear um, that as the FSA, um, we represent the interests of all uh, consumers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we will be uh, looking at what comes out of Europe and making sure that where necessary, we can form a view on the implications for consumers in Northern Ireland and provide the right advice to ministers in Northern Ireland on that basis. Thank you very much. Any further comments or questions? No, I think, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Amy and Rick, for the paper. Uh, we're invited to review the delivery of the risk assessment function within the FSA in the six months after uh, uh, the end of the European Union transition period and consider the next steps, um, the ongoing development of risk assessments in 2021 and beyond, which I think we have done. And uh, really grateful uh, to everyone who's mobilised uh, this huge new system of work uh, and uh, to see the evidence of progress that's uh, demonstrated today. So thank you very much indeed uh, for the paper. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Um, right, we're going to move us on to uh, the Food Hypersensitivity Programme uh, and an update on the work of the programme. I'm going to welcome Sushma Achara, Head of Policy and Strategy for Food Hypersensitivity, uh, to the meeting. Sushma. And um, Rebecca, uh, are you going to introduce the paper? I am, yeah. Similarly with uh, Rick and Amy, I'll say a very few words in introduction and then Sushma will just summarise the, um, the main points. Uh, so just to remind you, this is one of our regular reports to the board. Uh, food hypersensitivity is one of the FSA's top priority programmes uh, and going forward we'll be providing six monthly updates on progress. Um, this last year uh, has been a challenging year as, as we um, outlined in December when it was our last, uh, I think that was our last report. Uh, in particular, COVID-19 has had an impact on the research programme because many of our partners are in the health service and uh, the hospitality industry. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, and obviously, um, you know, it's had a big impact on their ability to engage with us. Uh, however, um, even in spite of that, I I'm really pleased with the progress we've made on a number of fronts. So I'm going to hand over to Sushma now for a very short summary. Thank you, Sushma. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, board members. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, the paper is an update, as Rebecca's outlined, of the work that we've done since our last report to the board in December. I uh, just wanted to highlight some key elements, really, of the, the board, uh, recognising that we're continuing our efforts and work in terms of pre-packed direct sales, which is legislation coming into effect on the 1st of October. And we have been working with PACE, not only in terms of the advice, the technical guidance, but the campaign that we started last year. So uh, an enormous amount of work, and we're actually targeting those small businesses who may not be aware or require extra support in our, in our current work. Um, the other sorts of areas that we are, are concentrating our energies on are precaution allergen labelling, which is the may contain, and we've got uh, uh, plans to run a, 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 a consultation later this year. It's an area where there is quite heightened uh, uh, need for understanding the use of labelling and the main contain type of ingredients that are highlighted in that space. We're also continuing our efforts on the food allergy safety scheme and we'll be undertaking some further research. We're building on the work that we reported to the board in December. In particular, we've now obtained further qualitative uh, uh, assessments and information from consumers in terms of their views on such a, uh, an allergy scheme and what we might need to consider and what we might need to build on. Um, pleased to say that we ran a successful symposium in March 
which had great stakeholder input into the two key areas of precaution, allergy and labelling and food allergy safety scheme, uh, we were able to get their, their, their views uh, on, on that. And uh, we have launched our expert stakeholder uh, uh, panel uh, first meeting took place on Monday, where we've gathered together experts, stakeholders to input into the development of the program. I wouldn't want to forget the science and evidence, and actually the paper highlights the amount of science and evidence that is uh, ongoing uh, to support the work of the program, and in particular the NHS data information that was published in the British Medical Journal earlier this year. We've still got some further work that they'll be undertaking to support some of the key areas, such as the um, uh, uh, allergy safety scheme and the work research we need to undertake. And lastly, I just want to draw attention to the cost of living model. There's been field studies that have been undertaken. This is fairly fundamentally important for the program because it will add as a model, provide some measures in terms of the societal benefit that this program will make in terms of those consumers who suffer from food hypersensitivity and how we can make a difference in terms of our policy development and our program activities as we move forward. So I'm happy to take questions um, uh, uh, on the back of the summary on the basis that uh, board members will have read the paper. Thank you very much indeed, Sushma. And, uh, you know, recognising the constraints on uh, some of the areas uh, in making progress due to the COVID pandemic, it's still pleasing to see uh, some of the work that has been uh, ongoing this year. So, uh, Rebecca, did you want to come back in before I take questions? I, I did, actually. If, it, if it's OK, Chair, I just thought I might pick up some of the points raised by um, Mr Carey in his question to the board. Obviously, he's um, asked us some, some specific questions about allergy labelling on uh, restaurant menus. Um, and just to say that um, the, the chief executive has met with uh, Mr Carey to discuss the proposals uh, and we have uh, had some uh, helpful correspondence with him. So he's put forward his, uh, his views and uh, uh, um, explained uh, what uh, the campaign is doing to, to collect uh, evidence and information. And in turn, uh, we've provided more information about the kind of evidence that we would be looking for. Um, as we discussed previously, it's very important that... Um, uh, information to consumers is seen uh, in context, in a wider context, and that we pay close attention to the um, the evidence about what the uh, impacts are going to be, and uh, and we we look forward to working uh, working further with Mr. Carey on this. Our own information, our own survey uh, that we conducted recently, suggested that uh, almost sixty percent of uh, businesses already do provide allergy information on their menus. Uh, which is uh, obviously, um, you know, what they feel is going to work for them and their customers. Uh, and obviously, that's very encouraging to hear that so many businesses are looking at whether this is a useful way to help their, to help their customers. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Just for the record, I attended that meeting as well with Mr Carey and uh, was um, humbled to hear um, uh, both the situation they've experienced and Owen's tragic death, but also the ideas they have going forward. Colm. Chair, thank you very much, and Susan, thank you very much for, for your um, presentation and paper. Uh, and I look forward to, to seeing you next week when you're coming along to talk to the Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee uh, when we're going to get into this in a bit more detail. I suppose my my, my questions are are sort of fairly fairly short and straightforward, and it's around uh, what who, who whenever we talk about the stakeholders, who are the stakeholders, and to what extent is the patient. Uh, and the patient voice largely heard within that stakeholder community, uh, and uh, and what what more can we do to sort of ensure we we, we get that? And if you could say a little bit more, uh, just about what we 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 or who we're partnering with in terms of cost of illness modelling and those sorts of things, uh, and just if you say a little bit more about the uh, the the food allergy uh, the scheme uh, that you referred to in the paper, uh, let me just get the title of it. Yeah, the Food Allergy Awareness uh, Scheme. So th just a little bit more about those. Thank you, Sushma. Okay, Sushma, do you want to pick those up? 
Yes. Um, I'll start off with the stakeholder groups that you mentioned. So in any of the work or researches that we have undertaken, we, ha we um, include not only consumers, food high sensitivity consumers as well, but also clinicians. So one of the key elements of the work that we do is we take a broad spectrum of stakeholder input into, in, in, into, into the work that we do. In relation to the uh, expert panel that we have just established, We've got allergy charities, we've got industry, we've got local authorities and research organisations. And whilst we may not necessarily be, uh, uh, be uh, having patients directly involved in that, we do actually ensure that our research does encapsulate patients who are impacted or those who represent patients, the clinicians, in, in, in the work that uh, we take account of as part of our evidence. Um, in relation to the food allergy safety scheme, um, the uh, work that we've undertaken thus far is to speak to consumers uh, plus clinicians uh, to get a broader view of what we might, might be required. And what we're intending to do as part and parcel of our development of this work is to actually assess what schemes actually exist in terms of standards they set and actually what sort of aspects they look at. The feedback that we've had from consumers are that it's fairly complicated. It's not a case of piggybacking off an existing scheme, although we would explore that in terms of standards. Consumers are concerned about the level of allergen management, what a scheme will do and how it would be uh, measured or ranked. It's not a case of having a, a five-star rating because for, for somebody suffering from an allergen uh, issue or a, 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 an allergy, they would like to know it's a pass or fail to be ensured that they go into an establishment and they know that there's allergen management and risk assessments that have been undertaken that they are reassured. One of the key things that has come out from the research is that consumers, even if you have an allergy safety scheme, will do their due diligence. They rely on themselves and therefore they do have this as a comfort in terms of the confidence of businesses asking them and having the communication but it does not move away from the fact that it's a fairly complicated area because not only is it the 14 allergens that are listed, uh, there are lots of other substances and foods which individuals are, are allergic to. So we've got to take a, a, a overall broad stock of the research and the evidence and the needs to actually see what would be suitable in this space. Thanks, Sushma. Margaret. Thank you, Sushma. Really interesting paper as ever. Um, and um, I was really interested to see Paul Carey's um, question and so glad that you, um, Ruth and uh, Emily, have um, spoken with him. Um, as you know, I have a son who um, uh, lives with food allergies and so I know what um, uh, Owen must have been living through and he trusted what he was told and he lost his life. And the power now is in his legacy and the uh, work that um, Paul Carey is now doing is really important and he's raising some really good ideas and I'm so glad that the FSA is um, espousing them and looking at, at them um, because of course he's not, Owen was not a patient, he's a consumer. Um, and then a couple of other uh, points to make. Um, the uh, We so need to progress the word on precautionary allergy labelling, I, I may contain or made in a factory because I don't believe that works. Uh, and that's just from personal experience, but um, it gives false hope to younger um, people who may be living with allergy. Um, secondly, I just wonder uh, how the food um, allergy reaction reporting mechanism is going to work. I think um, the FSA has, has been exemplary in, um, in reaching out to industry and uh, including small businesses, but it's still difficult sometimes to get through to consumers, particularly the younger ones. And then finally, just in, in the cost, um, there's a huge cost to the NHS, which um, rarely gets mentioned, which is the cost uh, to that uh, of uh, adrenaline pens, which uh, sufferers carry, you know, two to four uh, renewable every year, hopefully uh, not used. Um, but obviously, the more we can do to um, get rid of the entire problem, the better. Now, I know that's not within our reach, but um, I just make the point of that as an extra cost. Thank you. Sushma, any comments? Uh, just to pick up on a, a couple of points. 
precaution, knowledge and labelling. I think, Margaret, you've highlighted the need for something to happen in this space. And this is one of the reasons why we are going to be consulting and taking a broader reach in terms of the views of not only food businesses, but consumers who have a uh, difficulty in interpreting these may containing labels. It's all associated with the qualitative and quantitative risk assessments that businesses do, but also what consumers take from them. Uh, what we did glean from this symposium and the stakeholder input is consistency of wording. People have so many different ways of explaining precautionality and labelling and also where we could actually make that policy difference because it's a joint effort with industry, with consumers, and it's an international issue, uh, as has been highlighted uh, across the spread. Codex is going to be producing something in October on precautionality and labelling, which we will obviously take into account. And we are co-chairs of Codex uh, on their full food labelling committee and have uh, inputted into development of guidance, which we are taking stock. So I'm reassured that we are in the right direction, and I'm certainly sure that we're in the right direction of taking some steps in that in that in that um, area. On the allergen reporting mechanism, yes, we've undertaken some further discovery work. We actually uh, spoke with clinicians, consumers, and did some discovery work. And what be has become clear is that um, consumers want to report near misses things that do not result them in going into hospital, but they have a different um, a need as to why they want to report. It's to raise awareness, it's to provide information. And we are clear that this is a data gap that we do not capture at this present moment in time. We have the hospital and clinical data, but we don't necessarily have the near misses. And what they have indicated is they wouldn't want to see enforcement action, they want to do that themselves. So we are developing discovery and building on this discovery with a view that we will have workshop about the data we can collect, how we can use it, how we can signpost consumers and actually run a proof of concept by the end of this year if things go to, go to plan to actually test out how successful it would be and how useful it would be. Uh, consumers just want to know how data is being used and they want it to be used for policy intervention. And the last point about uh, uh, the uh, consumer uh, input in the younger people, I'd like to reassure the board, we are campaigning, we did a successful campaign, Speak Up for Allergies, which was aimed at the young groups, 18 to 21 year olds, to actually have the confidence to speak to food businesses when they go in to ask and declare their allergies, and we're building on it. I'm pleased to say we had a reach through all the various channels of a million young people and consumers, and we reached 200,000 food businesses through that campaign, which was a one month long campaign, and the advertising that we did on the, on the back of that. So it's not gonna miss, young people require uh, and are a vulnerable group that we concentrate on as part and parcel of our work. Okay, thank you. Rebecca, did you want to come in on these points? Yeah, just really quickly, actually, I thought it would be helpful just to set out the FSA's view on precautionary allergen labelling, just to make sure that this is crystal clear. Um, this is not a get out of jail free card. We are crystal clear with businesses that if they're going to use a precautionary allergen statement, it needs to be based on an actual risk assessment. Uh, so, uh, you know, there has to be evidence behind the use of, uh, of the statement. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, and secondly, just to clarify uh, something Sushma mentioned about farm, uh, when, when consumers tell us they want to do the enforcement themselves, that, that sounds slightly alarming. Uh, what, what they mean is that they will report to their local authority, uh, who um, obviously have the relationship with the local businesses or perhaps make a complaint to the, to the business. What they want from the FSA, though, is they want us to be able to take into account the experiences as we're developing policy. Uh, and uh, that, that is what their motivation will be in providing information to us through this new scheme. Excellent, thank you. Peter? What Rebecca has just said is very useful in terms of underlining that the precautionary labelling is not a get-out-of-jail card and needs to be supported by research. Uh, by consideration of, of, of what really are the dangers. Um, Sushma commented about the field being complicated, and certainly it's that. Uh, and the reach issue is so important. And when our Welsh Advisory Committee looked at this one, 
uh, they were particularly concerned because in Wales we tend to have a higher proportion of small business and uh, I note the uh, emphasis on trying to reach and, and the efforts that have been made to reach small businesses and I'm just underlining that in the Welsh context particularly. Um, there are also differences of course in uh, legislative ways uh, and regulatory ways in between Wales and England in the uh, food hygiene rating scheme uh, being a statutory scheme and uh, there there is some linkage with the um, allergy safety scheme um, and some complexity and uh, that needs to be clarified both at the level of the business and also uh, the level of consumer understanding um, and uh, the local authorities have um, slightly different uh, functions and uh, where you're referring to the guidance note on changes in allergy labeling um, uh, the uh, value of that for local authorities in Wales and the distinctive issues is underlined uh, and uh, one praiseworthy comment is that uh, it's uh, going to be produced uh, with uh, bilingual videos for the local authorities in Wales uh, that was very much welcomed, Diane Dio. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll take Fiona's questions as well, and then uh, Sushma, I'll come back to you to uh, respond. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, um, Ruth. Um, Sushma, thank you. I mean, it's a really significant uh, piece of work that you're doing, and, I, and, and the one that I wanted to ask, uh, the area I wanted to ask a question about is this major change that's coming in in October um, for PPDS. Um, you're doing a very big piece of work to push that communications out ahead of it coming into force. Um, and my question is, um, what are you going to be doing afterwards from October for the next 12 months or so? just to make sure that it has been adopted and that it's being put to good and effective use um, in the outlets that we're targeting. Okay, so Shushma, do you want to respond to both Peter and Fiona's comments? Yes, start with Fiona, if you don't mind. Uh, Fiona, a very, very uh, excellent question. Um, I don't see the work stopping when 1st of October looms. The work of the team will continue as we, as we are uh, uh, reaching a, a critical critical mass in terms of not only the questions and the answers that are being asked and raised of us and my team, but also in terms of that continuing. I expect that post-October that will continue in terms of the guidance that is required from us in this space. Uh, we will be actually undertaking a review of how implementation has taken and how it's it's bedded down as part and parcel of the aftermath from October. So we will be reporting to the board in due course once we get to that uh, particular milestone. There's a specific piece of work that our, uh, our, our science and evidence colleagues will be undertaking and are reviewing uh, to assist us in, in, in that change. So hopefully that's, uh, that's um, a comfort for you in that response. Um, taking up the question from Peter, uh, as I as I mentioned, PAL, uh, precaution allergen labelling, uh, I think as, as Rebecca's highlighted, it applies across the spread. It's not a solution. It's a way of in, ensuring where we can assist and uh, help not only consumers but businesses. And we're mindful that this will include all sorts of businesses, businesses across the UK, including those in Wales. So I would give you the reassurance that it's not the case that Wales won't be included. Uh, businesses across the UK have been recruited in previous surveys, including Wales. Um, uh, for, for example, uh, the uh, PPDS work that we've done has included, uh, you know, surveys of, of Welsh, Welsh, Welsh businesses um, in the interviews that we've undertaken to see exactly what was required by retailers and why, what sort of level of support um, that can be provided. In terms of the link between the food hygiene rating scheme 
and uh, the um, allergy safety scheme. I think there are some core areas that we will need to explore and really, really need to be concentrating our efforts on. We're going to be doing a deep dive into the food hygiene rating scheme to actually see what that what the scheme actually consists of and where it is aligns with what we want to achieve with an allergy safety scheme. But there are some clear tensions that we will need to work out because of the complexities of the responsibilities of certain local authority trading standards with environmental health, but also in terms of the needs of the consumers. And we're really, really mindful that uh, it's not necessarily all about just linking into an existing scheme. There are complications, as I said, people want to pass or fail if you're suffering from an allergy rather than a, a rating scheme in, 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 that, in that space. Um, I would also just sort of uh, outline that the consumer views will be taken across the spread. It's not no, not only limited in, in one area, we will take a stock of everything across the spread, mindful that, uh, you know, Welsh consumers have, have, have um, uh, uh, input in, into what our considerations are going to be. And really, really also are clear in our minds that local authorities, we've got to be clear not only about the complexities of the roles and the divisions, but also what extra burden would this place on, uh, on local authorities in terms of the requirements if there was an allergy uh, safety scheme. One of the things that's come out in the research that we've undertaken is actually a question from consumers who would it credit and who would actually um, uh, be um, be um, uh, 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 manning this? But is this really about standards, which may be a better use for consumers and give them the comfort that they re reach? We'll report back in due course once we've got the options ironed out uh, to the board. Thank you very much. Just my complex area and uh, clearly a lot of thought going into it. Maria, you've had your hand up. Do you want to add comments? Just briefly, Ruth, thank you. And um, just to reassure Fiona, um, local authorities will be responsible for enforcing the new um, prepack for direct sale regulations in food businesses. Um, and we're uh, providing really detailed advice and guidance to help local authorities to be able to do that. And in fact, um, they were they raised this particular issue with us when we were talking about the roadmap to recovery with them. So we have also built the requirements to um, enforce the, the new regulations into that roadmap as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca and Sushma, for, for the paper. Um, we're asked to note this update and the progress on the food hypersensitivity programme work streams. And um, uh, I think a huge encourage, encouragement to keep going and um, look forward to seeing how the work develops in the areas that you've outlined. Uh, so thank you very, very much indeed. I think uh, a key area for us to, to develop strategically. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to move us on to the final report of the Science Council Working Group on Food Hypersensitivity. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Sandy Thomas, Chair of the Science Council, and Dr. Paul Turner, Chair of the Science Council Working Group uh, 5 on Food Hypersensitivity to the meeting. Welcome both. Um, and I believe, uh, Sandy, uh, you're going to do uh, an introduction and Paul's going to speak to the paper and Rick will then respond. So thank okay. you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ruth. And good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be back here. And I'm also very pleased to be introducing the final report of, our, um, of the Science Council's review on food hypersensitivity. And as you might recall, uh, the board asked us to do two things. You tasked us with two activities back in May 2019. And the first was to advise on future research priorities and direction uh, in respect to food hypersensitivity. And the second activity was to review the science and evidence base for addressing food hypersensitivity and the part that FSA and others should play looking forward uh, in enhancing knowledge. And, and we, I'm going to uh, just comment briefly on those before I hand back to Paul. So hand to Paul. So firstly, we started scoping out these, these um, questions essentially uh, in June um, 2019. And then uh, in the following autumn, we established what has been working group five, our fifth working group since we were, uh, was since we started work. And so we really kicked off proper with the work uh, in, in November 2019. And I, and I can say that this has been one of the most extensive and challenging uh, reviews that the Science Council has done um, for the FSA. Now, we're fortunate that the review has been chaired by Paul Turner. Um, now, um, Dr. Turner is a leading international expert 
expert on pediatric food hypersensitivity. So this has been uh, a, a very good fit for the work. Um, and he's, of course, provided really dedicated and insightful leadership on behalf of the council uh, over the past two years. And he's also been assisted by one of our other council members who's come before the board in the past, uh, Professor John O'Brien, whose knowledge of food systems and horizon scanning, uh, this was really invaluable in considering the future priorities for work in this field. So the review uh, which we've completed has resolved itself essentially into two main stages. So the first was a look back um, at the previous uh, FSA research program on food allergy and intolerance to identify best practice and pr to provide insights on what kind of improvements um, might be made. And we reported this back to the FSA board um, as an interim report in September 2020. Now, the second stage um, is also one of two parts. And firstly, there's a, uh, this looks in general to the future. And we first looked at near-term research, uh, which we, we define as being over the next five years. And we looked at um, these priorities by doing a stakeholder survey and also a priority setting workshop, both of which went really were pretty useful. And the second element was to look at a longer time frame, 15, um, five to 15 years, and to look at the potential priorities. And that was essentially through a horizon scanning workshop. And the results of all this work are described in the final report, uh, which is presented to you today. And just um, one thing I'd like to do before handing over is just to acknowledge the, the really dedicated and extensive work that's been done um, by the Science Council Secretariat. The Science Council couldn't have delivered this work without the excellent support we've had. And we've really had a lot of help and advice from the FSA Food Hypersensitivity Science and Policy Team. So that has been really very, very important. I can't stress that too much. Particularly like to mention um, the uh, research program advisor, Dr. Ian, uh, actually Professor Ian Kimber, but there were many others uh, who I would, um, I don't have time to mention, but we, just to say that Paul um, Turner, uh, John O'Brien and myself really appreciate the work that has been done. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand over to Paul, um, who will go into more detail about the findings and recommendations in this final report. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Andy, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me back to the board meeting. Um, I'm just looking at the clock, and I can see that time is rapidly moving, so I think it might be a better use of time, because Sandra sort of covered the basics um, for me just to um, maybe go straight to Rick um, to hear his response, and then for the majority of the time we have available to be focused on taking your questions, if that's okay. I'm happy to do something different if you want. But hopefully you've all sort of read the report and Sanders actually said everything I was going to quickly comment on. So maybe if I hand over to Rick. OK, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Sandy. Um, it was very pleasing to hear um, your observations about the collaborative way in which you've uh, worked with the team at the FSA. And also, uh, as you say, huge thanks to everyone who's um, contributed to the thinking around this work. So thank you. Thank you both. So, uh, Rick, I think it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, I mean, I, I won't take very long either because um, obviously our formal response is in the paper and hopefully that's there and, and on the record for, for the board. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd really like to thank the Science Council um, for the for the report and we, we really welcome it. Um, a huge amount of effort has gone in um, right the way across the Science Council, but also um, especially Paul and John, who have very much led on it. Um, and I'd also like to echo Sandy's comments about um, recognising the huge effort from this, the FSA science team as well that's gone into supporting it. So, so thank you for those comments. Um, as a high level sort of summary, yes, we very much welcome the recommendations and, and we are sort of reviewing these now in detail. Um, we will be developing a detailed plan which will um, outline how we're going to address them and, and where appropriate um, implement new actions that, um, that address those recommendations. Um, I just wanted to say to the board, though, the one thing is that obviously while we've just received the, the final report now and we get the site of that, that final report, um, I just want to assure the board that a significant action is already ongoing. And as Paul mentioned, oh, or Sandy mentioned, um, there was an interim report that was presented last year. So we had some early sight of some of the recommendations and some of the things coming out of the report. And we've been able to pick up on some of those and start implementing some, um, some, some positive, uh, making some progress. 
There were um, just sort of three key areas that I wanted to highlight um, just uh, in terms of picking things out. And, and obviously the first of those is, is how much infrastructure we now have in place since, since 2019 and the, uh, the, the, the report was first commissioned. And the obvious thing is the food hypersensitivity reprogram. And, and then there's a lovely segue. We've just had Sushma and Rebecca's report on, on progress being made there. And I think one of the things I draw out is the number of times Sushma mentioned that interaction between science as evidence provided provider and policy as evidence customer and I think that's the the program approach is really um, uh, is, is really coming to um, to bear now and is, is really very productive. Um, the second point I wanted to make is just the, the, the sheer amount of uh, capability building we've done within science um, over, over the last few years in this area as well. So not only the science team, but also in things like the research and evidence programs that we've talked about. We have ARIs where we have real priorities um, um, uh, highlighted for um, uh, food hypersensitivity. And again, the work that the Science Council has done will feed into that, into revising those and reshaping those as we go through that um, research and evidence program cycle. Um, and also we heard from Michelle earlier about the work we're doing on horizon scanning and that's going to be another critical component of, of how we address food hypersensitivity evidence needs going forward. Um, and the final, my very final point is, um, is not only was this about food hypersensitivity, but I think one of the things the Science Council have given us is a lot of learning um, which we can take into other areas. So we very much use this as a, as, a, as a pilot for how we shape some of our thinking about research and evidence programs in other areas, um, but also some of the um, some of the, the ways the workshops have been run and we can pick that up and we can learn from that and we can take that forward in other ways. So it has not only a legacy for food hypersensitivity, but also the way we, we operate in other areas. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. So comments or questions from colleagues? Mark. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, um, hi, Sandy and Paul. Good to see you again. Um, I've been really looking forward to this paper. This paper, uh, or the work on it, started when I was uh, still serving on the Science Council, and I know just how much effort has gone into producing this. Uh, my reflection, before I ask my question, is um, actually, uh, as an agency, we should uh, consider ourselves to be extremely fortunate with the quality of the expertise, both on our Science Council and in its secretariat, uh, to be able to produce this work. Uh, really, I think is a real strength and really helps us to put science at the heart of what we do. Um, so I would congratulate everyone who's been involved in this on uh, both the work and the report. Um, my question is probably more for Rick than for, than for Paul or Sandy, really, which is, um, I picked a line out of Michelle's presentation earlier, which says it's only worth it if it's acted on. Um, there's a note in here that there is an implementation plan being progressed, but it says in due course. And I just wondered if you'd give us an idea as what in due course might mean. Rick? Sorry, wrong button. Um, I, it, 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 it's, it's being worked on as we speak. Um, and I would hope that we would have something um, ready in the, the coming months. So um, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will commit to a, a summer um, early draft of the, the implementation plan. We won't hold you to a definition of summer. Um, okay, thanks, Tim. Thanks very much. And yeah, great paper, great work that's being done. And having been on one of the, the groups that used to contribute uh, to the, the council, um, you know, I can see the real benefit of having a very robust evidence-based approach. Specifically, uh, I've really enjoyed seeing the development around the cost of illness framework. Um, really pleased to see work that's being done around willingness to pay thresholds. Um, and I think that is going to be really important to demonstrate value, um, but also to be clear about our decision making on what's worth funding, what isn't. And also, I guess, in setting our, our stall out for uh, Treasury and the public to demonstrate our value uh, and to do that in quite tangible terms. Um, earlier in this meeting, I had picked up on the issue around how much we can do that alongside other agencies to get, uh, if you like, composite measures of economic benefit and whether or not that could feed in to uh, what we're prepared to pay for, how we present our value. And I just wondered whether there's any thoughts or intentions to think about how that might be done. 
Thanks. Who'd like to pick that one up? Rick? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good point, Tim. And actually, one of the things that, that we are doing with all our cost of illness work, so I should say that um, it, it, it's a comprehensive portfolio of work. So we've we've obviously, you've seen the work that's been done on foodborne disease. Um, there's ongoing work on food hypersensitivity, and there's there's going to be um, updates on that very soon. Um, we're also working on things like chemical um, chemical risks as well. So there, there will be a full package of, of work around um illness, foodborne illness. Um, part of this as well is is we are cutting for um, you know fresh turf on some of this because it hasn't been done before. So there is a, a lot of learning from other areas where we're trying to uh, make sure that we are um, using the best practice. And actually, the economics team are, are very much working with others. So, for example, I mentioned the chemical um, risk assessment and the chemical uh, cost of illness work we're doing. We're, we're doing in conjunction with Exeter University and, and, and Professor Richard Smith, who's a, a really strong health economist in, in, and, um, and, and has great expertise in that area. Um, the other thing we are also doing is um, drawing very much on the international community. So there are sort of um, international sort of economics regulatory groups that we, we link in with. And um, part of that was raised in the international conference that we held back in March. Um, there were lots of representatives there from, from the United States, Canada, et cetera, who came from that community. So as well, it's about sharing international best practice. So again, it's what can we learn from others to draw in. So So yeah, it's very much part of a network rather than the FSA just just developing methodologies on our own. Okay, thank you very much. Paul, you'd like to comment? Yes, just to sort of pick up the first part of, of, of Tim's comment, which is um, the management of food hypersensitivity at a public health level really does cross multiple government agencies. And in the past, there has been um, a lot of um, frustration, should I say, over how um, different agencies have been able to work or not work, often due to very good reasons, such as, you know, it's not a priority, there are other priorities, particularly with COVID and so on. Um, you know, we're looking at... Um, there isn't even consistency across the different regions. So, for instance, Public Health England has a role, but in some regions, but not in other regions, and in other regions, that role is devolved over to the FSA. Um, so it is a very complicated picture. My sense is things are improving. I think the FSA over the last couple of years really has sort of stood up and, and, and sort of championed the cause for food hypersensitivity. And I strongly encourage from a Science Council perspective, as well as a sort of a, a, a interested party, that that concept Continues to really sort of try and rally around DEFRA, the Department of Health, the MHRA, Public Health England, or the Health Security Agency, whatever that they might be called in the future, and the Department of Education. Because remember, the major proportion of people who are affected come under the remit of schools and education, which is the Department of Education. Perhaps, you know, one of the ways that we really can improve things, and this was flagged up throughout the report, trying to improve current knowledge of food hypersensitivity amongst the public, which would then pay off in people who work in the food industry, um, perhaps that could be something that's targeting departments of education. So, so well done, FSA, and do carry on banging the drum, and maybe we can actually start making, you know, continue to make real sort of bounds in terms of improving um, the management at the public health level for food hypersensitivity. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Any other comments from board members? Well, thank you very much. Can I uh, really just say uh, how much uh, this has helped uh, develop our thinking? Um, you know that food hypersensitivity is a strategic priority. We'll be reviewing our strategy going forward with our incoming chair, Professor Susan Jeb, who's actually observing the meeting today. So we'll have heard your, your comments about the importance of this area of work. And, and uh, I think we warmly welcome uh, the quality of what you've done, as Mark said, um, excellent contribution to our thinking. Um, and you've underlined the importance of working with all the different agencies, um, particularly you know, the public health bodies, but also other bodies such as education and, and so on. And I, I think that's absolutely key for us going forward is that we do have the opportunity to uh, convene colleagues uh, and be champions of an issue, even if all the levers are not in our uh, control. And um, I think the importance of us uh, being visible in, in that partnership is, is important. So thank you very much for those comments. And again, to echo Mark's comments on the desire to see the implementation plan uh, emerging at uh, some point over the summer. 
so that we can uh, see how we respond to the recommendations of this excellent work. So just to say um, thank you very much indeed. We were asked to consider the working group's report and agree the proposed FSA response to the recommendations which we've done. So once again, thank you, uh, Paul, for the work uh, in chairing the group and Sandy also for leading the Science Council in this excellent piece of work. Thank you. And we hope to see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Um, right. So we'll move on to uh, our next paper, uh, which is a, a paper on a proposed Food Standards Agency, Food Standards Scotland, annual report on food standards. And uh, Rebecca is going to introduce the paper. Rebecca. Hi, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this is a, an update paper uh, outlining plans for a new joint FSA and FSS annual report. Um, we touched on this earlier in the meeting uh, as a key opportunity for us to uh, set out how we are, in fact, representing the interests of consumers, taking a broad look at uh, food standards. So it, it's proposed that this annual report would, for the first time, provide a routine and regular retrospective overview of how food standards change over time, uh, very firmly grounded in science and evidence. Uh, the heart of the report will be focused on consumer interests and whether food standards have been maintained or improved, which is obviously our objective. Um, and uh, we would also note any key upcoming issues. Uh, we are aiming for this to be accessible, authoritative and independent, uh, a real go-to report for consumers and external stakeholders. This paper outlines our approach and uh, we are obviously still working on the content, thinking about the evidence base that we will draw on is clearly going to be key. Uh, and we've also noted in the paper how we are working with uh, partners in uh, other government departments and of course in all of the different countries of, uh, of the United Kingdom. So uh, once again, I'm very grateful for your comments and observations. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So it's really important um, decision that was made that we would have an annual report uh, and that it's joined with FSS. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to comment on uh, the, the nature of that report and how it will sit in the, the landscape uh, of uh, reporting. So any comments from board members? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, I warmly welcome this paper and I congratulate officials on the innovative work you're doing. And I particularly like the proposal for a joint report with, with, with Scotland. That's terribly important. Now, we understandably concentrate on things in food which can kill us or make us ill, but I often feel we're not giving enough attention uh, to food being what it is or claims to be, and therefore a report in food standards is terribly important. However, I hope this is not going to be just a bland report talking about everything we did during the year. I hope that we will be, we will be robust enough to at some point in the report say to government uh, what we want to happen, the things that need to happen. That may be full calorie labelling, argue again possibly for it apply to alcohol and target fake food, whether that's adulterated honey or, or fake meat in the catering trade. I think we need to spell out not just what we've done well, but the gaps in the system where its government needs to address if we're to guarantee that food is what it says it is. And finally, on the Agriculture Act report, I assume the only section of relevance to us is clause 19, subsection 2, subsection E, quote, food safety and consumer confidence in food, unquote. Again, can we take that opportunity to emphasize to the government that it really needs to sort out labeling, nutrition guidance, enforcement resources, especially in the catering sector, so that we can give consumers genuine confidence that food is what it says it is. And again, could we use that opportunity to make the point that the food hygiene rating system should be published on the doors? I know this may sound a bit radical and lobbying, but we are an independent organisation. And if we're reporting to government, I think we're under a duty to tell government what we want in order to do a better job in future. And sorry, the very final report a point. Can we see a draft of, will the board see a draft of the reports in good time so that we may make some observations or comments without interfering with the executive, of course? Thank you for those uh, observations. And uh, part of the work going forward will be uh, discussing with FSS um, also uh, how we manage the production of the report and also the, the final clearance of the report and so on. So uh, we'd, we'd take the note about um, 
when and how people see it. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to respond specifically on any of the points? Uh, yeah, I can pick up a few of those. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, support. And uh, I think I can say that the FSA is not often accused of being bland. We um, uh, we obviously, you know, we are transparent and evidence based, and uh, you know, we make sure that our uh, advice and views are clear, and we fulfil that duty to represent the interests of consumers, uh, which we do independently. Um, and uh, we, so we'll, uh, and I, I, we'll take those um, reflections on the the approach of the report on board and we'll come back to you when we uh, when we report back as, as we say in the paper um, we'll have another opportunity to to explain a bit more about how we how we want to um, approach the content uh, but again noted that um, you've, you've suggested that we might want to take a, a, a clearer forward look um, and identify areas for further work so that's very helpful. Um, in terms of the um, the Agriculture Act and Section 19 report uh, that's obviously an opportunity for um, Secretary of State um, uh, to invite uh, uh, comments and contributions from uh, um, relevant parties. Uh, the FSA is not specifically named in that legislation, but obviously we would be an obvious uh, 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 party to ask for advice on, on those aspects, and, uh, and we certainly uh, would welcome being invited to do so. Um, however, obviously, that is not our report, and, uh, and so we'll need to uh, consider the question that we've been asked. Um, but going back to the report, this annual report that we're discussing now, that certainly is an opportunity for us to take a broader look. And as we said at the beginning, uh, when we were thinking about that role to represent consumers' broader interests, uh, you know, we've we've uh, identified that there are some um, some key strategic issues for us to consider when we're thinking about what those might be in the areas that we choose to comment on. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to quickly uh, link up with this uh, on the comment that Peter made in response to my report earlier in this meeting. I think the annual report is also an excellent opportunity for us to uh, do much of that kind of consumer explaining role, not necessarily within the report, but associated with it. So we'll look very much to identify where there are areas that we think some kind of clarification would be helpful to consumers and, and link that up um, uh, in conjunction with that report in due course. Thank you. Margaret. Thanks. You've touched on a couple of points. Just one other thing. Um, do you anticipate areas of disagreement with FSS and how will you deal with these? And um, it would be lovely to see you exploit areas where we may see that um, something, for example, is mandatory in Scotland and not in England, and therefore emphasis on whether that's uh, whether it works uh, better when it's mandatory than not. Um, you can guess what I'm talking about, but um, just that area. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, shall I come in, Chair? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I think you're right that um, <clears throat> uh, thinking about how um, food uh, standards or food regulations may have diverged uh, is obviously going to be of uh, key interest, I know, to a lot of stakeholders and also to consumers. So that will definitely be something we'll consider. I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't characterise differences as disagreements necessar necessarily. Uh, clearly, just as uh, happens now, um, you know, there are different risk assessment decisions, uh, you know, appropriate to the evidence and, and the interests of consumers in different countries uh, of the United Kingdom. So that's not new. Uh, but it is something that we'll we'll want to focus on and uh, make sure that we bring out any any issues. Thank you. Any other points? Any further points to shape this report? No. Okay. So, uh, well, thank you very much indeed for the update. Um, critically important piece of work for us to uh, to, to develop. And um, the board is asked to note the update, which we do. Um, and uh, I, th I think, Rebecca, you've collected quite a few comments on forward look, um, the level of explicitness about our uh, requirements, uh, the importance of consumer benefit from the report, uh, and also how we uh, maximise the comparative nature of the work with Scotland and take the whole UK approach. So uh, lots to think about there. And uh, also how the process of producing the report and how the board will be involved going forward, which... Uh, I guess you'll take that away along with the other points. So thank you very much indeed to you and the team for the work on, on that. I look forward to seeing it develop. 
So uh, we're now going to move on to a uh, report from the chair of ARAC. So Colm, can I ask you to present the report? Yes, indeed, Chair. Thank you very Thank you. much. Members will note that there are two uh, reports there of our last two Audit and Risk Assurance Committee meetings on the 20th of May and the 9th of June. Uh, I'll refer you first to the 20th of May one when the main item, is, as is always the case in, in the May meeting, is to go through in some detail the annual report on accounts uh, for the FSA, for Westminster, for the Consolidated Accounts and for Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, we did that uh, and made some comments and some updates to the reports. Uh, they were subsequently passed to other board members who do not sit on IRAC for their input. Uh, and then that came back to the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee on the 9th of June for final approval. Also at that meeting, uh, members will remember that uh, we uh, were party to a national audit office value for money report on the food system uh, with significant responsibilities given to the FSA to deliver that report in 2019. Uh, delighted to report that we, we had the director, the VFM director, uh, along at our ARAC meeting in May, uh, and he was able to give us the comfort that all of the actions that are for which the FSA are responsible uh, have been completed uh, and, and effectively moved off that report and into business as usual within the FSA and other parts of government who had responsibility for that. Uh, and we, we also received uh, a number of papers for information in, in that meeting. Uh, moving forward to the 9th of June meeting, we received the final uh, report on accounts. I'm delighted to uh, report that the uh, Audit and Risk Assurance Committee were able to, uh, on behalf of the board, recommend that the accounting officer sign off on the accounts and the accounts for uh, for Wales and Northern Ireland will be laid before their uh, respective parliaments and assembly before the end of June uh, is the plan for that. Uh, we are uh, The FSA have done as much as they possibly can uh, to get the accounts for Westminster and Consolidated ready for laying. We do have an issue, uh, as you remember from last year and the year before with the LPGS pension fund, that has got to be externally verified and we're, we're now hoping to lay those accounts uh, by the end of September, although there, there is some treasury uh, uh, allowance there for slippage should that happen. I would make the point that uh, due to the fantastic work of the finance team within the FSA, everything that we could possibly do has been done. Uh, so we're ready to go and just waiting that one. Uh, and it, it's, it's it's relatively immaterial. It's, it, it's a huge fund, but that the FSA input to it is quite small. Uh, However, we can't lay the accounts until we get the, that, that final sign off. Uh, but everything that could be done for the FSA has been done. Uh, we also uh, um, considered the annual report from the Chair of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee, and that was approved by IRAC, and that will be formally presented to the board at the September meeting. Uh, so that, that is my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Colm. Thank you yet again to IRAC for its ongoing work. Uh, in uh, covering these key areas for us. Um, any questions or comments from board members? So thank you. It's pleasing to note that the NAO report uh, has um, been judged as now business as usual. Um, and just again to reiterate what's said in the paper, uh, the evidence of uh, very effective uh, work for the teams within the FSA who yet again have produced um, a very good uh, response for the external auditors and also evidence of such strong collaborative working. Um, so again, thanks to everyone involved um, no, in the uh, process. And if I could just add that uh, uh, the the work of IRAC is made actually quite easy by the tremendous work that was on by the teams that, that support that, organi that, that organization. So thank you to my, my, my fellow members of IRAC, but particularly uh, to Emily, to Chris and all of the teams that have contributed to, to make it a fairly smooth process. Yeah. Thank you, uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the reports from the Food Advisory Committee. So Colm, I think you've still got uh, the, the, the spotlight. Okay, uh, no, the, the uh, Food Advisory Committee in, in, in Northern Ireland has met uh, a couple of times recently uh, ahead of the May board meeting and we had a really good discussion with some input uh, from the, the, the meat industry in particular when we considered the, the Operation Transformation Programme uh, those comments were taken on board and, and very much involved in that program. So we got that, that, that particular cohort involved in that program. Uh, we met again last week to consider the board papers, and, and I've tried to reflect some of the comments that, that came through from, from those meetings. Uh, and we have an, our, our, our open meeting, our next open meeting, 
uh, next uh, Wednesday um, on uh, specifically on food hypersensitivity. And uh, it looks to be a really exciting agenda. We'll hear from Sushma and a bit more and some colleagues in a bit more detail at that meeting. Uh, we get a couple of case studies from two local authorities in Northern Ireland. Uh, one good, one bad. So one when, when, when it was well managed and one where there's lessons to be learned, let's say. Uh, and uh, m- most importantly, I'm really excited to look forward to uh, uh, one of our uh, patients, one of our users who actually worked with us in some of the uh, the campaign in that 18 to 21 cohort that, that Sushma talked about uh, and a uh, young university student is, is, is keen to come along and talk to the committee and answer some questions. So that'll be quite revealing and I think there could be some really good lessons that we can bring forward to, to the board. That's very encouraging to have consumer input into your deliberations. So thank you. Thank you for that update. Any questions to Colm? No? Okay. So, uh, Peter, an update from the Welsh Food Advisory Committee. Since uh, the last board meeting three weeks ago, we have met uh, last week in order to consider the papers for today's meeting. uh, And we should be meeting again as a committee uh, in July uh, and uh, on that occasion, having a bit of a, a review of uh, where things are going in various programs, notably with local priority work. Um, we will also uh, next week have the opportunity of meeting the new minister who is responsible for uh, FSA linkage. And uh, on that occasion, I'm delighted that uh, you, Ruth, and Emily, uh, and uh, Nathan Barnhouse, the director from Wales, and I will be meeting the minister. uh, And also that uh, Susan Jebb will be joining us and therefore able to make a very early contact with the minister uh, and begin to get to grips with the evolved aspects of, uh, of life in uh, the relationship. So that's, I think, all the report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's good to um, make connection with the new minister uh, in Wales next week. So we look forward to that. Um, any comments or questions to Peter? No. So... Um, Well, thank you very much indeed for the work you do in in the Food Advisory Committee. It's always much appreciated. Um, We're now moving on to any other business. Um, We didn't have any notified at the beginning of the meeting, and um, I don't have any other business except to say that the next meeting of the FSA Board will take place on the 15th of September, and um, details will be determined uh, as the guidance develops over the next few months on on, uh, time, place, and so on. So we'll, we'll um, inform the board and the public as soon as possible when that, those decisions are made. Um, so that's the end of the uh, board meeting. Uh, we will have a business committee meeting uh, to follow. Um, we're slightly ahead of time, but um, my suggestion is that we take the benefit of that and still start as planned at 12.25 so that people can have a bite to eat. Um, if people are content to do that, we'll reconvene at 12.25 as um, planned. So I will see you all later for the business committee. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the uh, business committee meeting of the June uh, round of uh, meetings for the Food Standards Agency. Uh, I'd like to start with apologies. We have an apology from Julie Pierce. And also a very warm welcome to uh, two new board members, Lord Blancathra and Fiona Gately. Uh, and I'm also very pleased that um, Professor Susan Jebb, uh, who is our incoming chair, who starts on the 1st of July, uh, is attending the business committee uh, as an observer today. So welcome to Susan too. I'd like to give notice that if uh, at any point my internet connection uh, fails, then Margaret Gilmore will take over chairing the meeting. Do any members have any conflicts of interest to declare? Do any members have any items of any other business they wish to raise today? No, thank you. Can I move on then to the minutes of the 10th of March business committee meeting? 
and ask members to accept minutes as an accurate record of that meeting. People content? Yes, people content. Thank you very much. And then um, actions arising from the business committee meeting. Uh, any uh, complete? Any comments? No, thank you. Right, so we'll move straight on then to um, uh, the chief executive's report to the business committee and ask Emily to introduce her report. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, there are a number of things I wanted to return uh, to refer to today. Um, I'm always conscious that this report comes out a little later than some of the other board and business committee papers. Um, so I'll run through them verbally. So um, first of all, just in terms of our um, uh, delivery of meat official controls and our wine and dairy work, we continue to be in the position of having had no service failures. We've done 100% service delivery, which, as you remember, over the period of the winter, we were quite worried about. We do still have some concerns about veterinary capacity, which I mentioned in the report. Um, you'll remember in March, I let you know that we have given some additional money to our service delivery partner um, to try and help them uh, uh, retain and recruit vets. Um, we've seen reduced nutrition levels um, but we also are struggling they are struggling some official better so just to let you know that remains an issue and we're taking steps to prepare contingencies for the summer in case we do struggle with staffing um, we're seeing um, the, um, the the receding of the effect of um, COVID on our staff absence and um, so as I said we had no staff absent for COVID um, uh, on the 7th of June um, and our shielding staff are back at work um, so I'm pleased that that is uh, that we, we get it. it feels like we're slightly back to normal certainly on the operational side less so obviously um, on the office based side we're still staff are largely working from home um, turning to the National Food Crime Unit I wanted to just refer to this investigation that we called Operation Orchid device. We've made quite a difficult decision to take no further action against the people who were under investigation in relation to fraud at Russell Hume, which was a meat business. Um, the, Russell Hume knowingly misled their customers in the way that they uh, labelled meat in respect of traceability and shelf life. And we um, found that in 2018 and took a number of steps then to, um, to ensure that meat was destroyed and so on. But we had been pursuing a criminal investigation. We made a technical legal error um, in the way that the investigation was conducted um, in its early stages. And we've only uh, discovered in very recently that that means that we're not able to pursue the case. Um, a, contributory factor, a contributory factor to that was the fact that we don't have access to um, Police and Criminal Evidence Act powers. It's not the only reason. Uh, that we made the error, but it would have made a difference. So we, we um, want to continue making our case to government ministers for those powers. Okay, I'll turn next to shellfish. Uh, and my report mentions that we've been refining our dis uh, the way that we distinguish between Class A and Class B waters. Um, this is important, it has been important since January because the EU has said that only uh, shellfish from Class A waters can be directly imported into the EU and that is a big market for shellfish producers um, in the UK. Um, until then, the boundary between Class A and B had been less significant. Um, so we've uh, announced this week that we're making technical changes to the detailed protocols, um, and these are that we will exclude uncharacteristically high results and we'll take a proportionate approach to occasional results. Um, we're clear there's no additional public health risk to this quite technical and, and small change, um, and we are clear also that the changes are evidence-based. Um, these will be implemented in England and Wales and Northern Ireland with effect from this year's annual review of classifications um, which uh, is applicable from September. Uh, and then just two other themes to mention. Um, the first is our underspend. I've reported that we had uh, a £7.9 million underspend in our Westminster budget, which is quite a substantial amount for the FSA, given that our overall budget tends to be around the £120 million mark. Um, th this was an unavoidable consequence of covid 
there were a number of scientific um, activities and uh, policy and consultation activities that we had wanted to do, but our partners were not able or available to engage with that. And we had to do some considerable reprioritization. There were some additional costs from COVID, but we were able to cover those. Um, one of the issues for us was that um, some of that underspend was only forecast in the second half of the year. So we have um, looked at the way that we do our forecasting to try and make sure we can spot this earlier. So if necessary, we can intervene a bit sooner. And then this, the second theme uh, and last theme I wanted to mention was incidents. There's one in my report about melons, but there was also a product withdrawal, a product recall, sorry, last night um, of several cat food products because of safety concerns. And I just wanted Colin Sullivan to say something about that. Colin is our Chief Operating Officer and uh, always in charge of incidents. Thank you, Emily. Colin. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Chair, and good, good afternoon. So I wanted to uh, alert the board to a animal feed incident, uh, which is developing, and we are um, issuing communications along with Food Standards Scotland and DEFRA advising cat owners not to feed their ca cats specific uh, food products. Um, since April of this year, there have been over 100 cases of feline pancytopenia, which is often a fatal illness for cats. It is a, a rare condition, um, and often uh, there are around one or two cases per year. And it involves uh, the number of blood cells uh, rapidly decreasing and is often fatal. Uh, there's been a significant increase in the numbers, um, and uh, there has been a suggestion that there is a potential, and I would want to emphasize the word potential at this stage, link to dried food cat food uh, marketed for cats with hypoallergenic reactions. Uh, I w want to applaud the manufacturers and brand owners who have acted quickly and responsibly uh, once informed and agreed to a precautionary approach to organise a recall. Uh, we're working with the Royal Veterinary College in London, the Animal Plant uh, and Health Agency and other government departments across all four parts of the UK and with local authorities. I should say that there, at this stage, there's no definitive evidence to confirm a link to this food. Um, but uh, we're, and we don't think any other cats, uh, sorry, any other pets are known to be affected and that there's no known link to human illness. And finally, just to say that if cat owners are concerned about the health of their animals, that they should, of course, seek immediate advice from their vets. So, and that was because if we had uh, known about that last week, I would have written it in the report and I was just keen for Colin to update you on that front. That's everything I wanted to cover in my initial introduction. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Colin, for giving us that update. Um, right. So uh, questions on the paper. So I'm going to start with Colin. Sure, thank you very much. And Emily, thank you very much for, for the update. I have just a couple of, of, of questions, and one you may want to, one's on money, as you would expect from me, and you may want to defer that until later on with Chris. But on, on the first one, in relation to uh, the decision that we, we had to take not to pursue prosecutions in, in the particular case, and, and those of us who were on the board at the time would have seen this as a, as a really exemplary way to, to tackle that particular incident at the time. Uh, and unfortunate it ended in the way that it did. I know that you say that the, the, the lack of access to PS PARs wasn't the only reason that it, it, it didn't, but it was a factor. Because my question is, what are we doing and what more can we do to expedite the, 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 the getting of PS PARs? Because I'm, as, as we look forward, and from a Northern Ireland perspective, I am a little concerned about the potential for an increase in food crime and, and, and Northern Ireland being used as a route uh, through to the other the rest, because as I understand from the industry here, uh, the difficulties in the protocol are coming from GB to Northern Ireland. There's no difficulty going from Northern Ireland to GB. My concern is that there's going to need to be really good work between uh, the National Food Crime Unit, the PSNI, the NCA, and HMRC to ensure that we, we, we manage all of those things. But having PS bars is, is a really important part of that. So that, that's my first question around the PS bars. The second question, uh, and it's as much a comment as a question, uh, I, I note your point on, on underspend, and yes, it is a significant amount in, in relation to the budget. Uh, you're far from the only part of government in, in Westminster and Northern Ireland that has had underspends this year. And I, I would just like to remark that I think that what the FSA has delivered 
uh, without spending all of the money that was allocated to it is absolutely phenomenal. If you were a private sector company, there'd be bonuses payable for this sort of thing. So, you know, I think uh, uh, you know, we, we need to take that into account. All of that said, I am aware uh, that, that we do need to spend money that's allocated to us uh, uh, correctly. Uh, and what plans we got in place now. I know that we did shift our, our, our risk appetite as a board earlier this year, uh, but I'd like to see some robust plans to ensure that we, we don't find ourselves in a position of underspending the current year. But, you know, don't don't beat yourself and the team up too much. I think you've delivered fantastically, uh, despite having not spent all of the money. Thank you very much, Colm. Uh, Emily, do you want to comment on those two points? Thanks, Colm. We'll start on the last one, and um, perhaps I'll... Uh see if I can pass that on to those um, who oversee the senior civil service pay settlements because uh, the bonuses um, are as they are. There, there won't be any difference this year as to any previous year. But more seriously, um, and sorry, it's not just the senior civil servants, of course, it's the entire workforce who've, who've had an exceptional year. It, it has been a completely extraordinary year and we have done some uh, very fast-paced and rigorous and scientific work to try and keep food safe. Um, and it's it, it moves me to see what we've managed. Um, so thank you for saying that, and uh, and I completely agree with you. Um, and of course, we'll bring bring back um, for you, Colm, as chair of ARAC, make the, the, the question about robust plans. Um, and we've taken we we have taken to heart the risk appetite that the board set around spending, where you said that we had been too cautious, um, and we've definitely been trying to address that in the first quarter of this year. Um, on the hours is slowing us down in our national food crime unit um, investigation uh, when we need to um, arrest a suspect or interview them under caution we have to borrow a police constable from a police force and that means we have to liaise uh, with them we have to persuade them to allocate resources to this case um, and, and to assist us that's just one example there are many others so it is problematic that we don't have these powers we, I, I think informally we've probably managed to persuade some of the junior ministers in government that this is necessary, but the people we really need to persuade, it, it, it requires primary legislation. So we are going to need the, the cabinet to agree to this. Um, and we're also going to need to find a bill um, which has an appropriate uh, uh, remit scope so that we can add a clause to it or to, to, to deliver this. So that is our next objective um, we, we, um, we, I'm hoping that with the arrival of Susan um, as our new chair, we can press the case again in some of her introductory meetings. Um, but, but that's what we need is cabinet support. Thank you very much, Emily. I can see Chris got hand up. Did you want to comment on the budget? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it was just to build a little bit on what, what Emily has already said. So um, I, I would definitely support Colin's first um, comment about value for money. Um, I think, you know, the amount that we've delivered in um, in last year um, alongside um, not spending all the budget is excellent value for money. However, um, Colin did ask about some of the specific things that we are doing. Um, whilst last year was exceptional, uh, we are we are taking uh, steps to make sure that we do utilise all of this year's budget. Um, the first thing that we've done is introduce a pipeline um, because obviously it's a very it's a very complex um, food system that we're working with, and things are changing all the time, and delivery plans change all the time. Um, so having a pipeline of activity that are priorities for us, ready to go as and when any funding becomes available, is one of the things that we've done. We've also um, uh, put additional resource and effort into um, delivery assurance. We obviously had a, have a monthly foot financial forecast uh, mechanism and um, robust assurance on the on the delivery of business plans. So that is something else that will support us alongside reviewing how we get resource. Um, so obviously in order to deliver lots of these things, we need, we need people, we need um, skilled people, uh, uh, capability and capacity. And we're just seeing what we can do within the bounds of civil service resourcing uh, to, to make that a little bit more flexible to support the delivery of our plans. Thank you very much. Um, Mark's next. Next. Thank you, Ruth. Um, my, my first question was going to be about powers, but Colm's already covered that. Um, the only thing I would add to that is just to ask whether there's any support, Emily, you or uh, colleagues need from us as a board in your endeavours on that front. Um, my, my other two points are reflections, really. The first one is around the audit from the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office. 
Um, as somebody who's been on the receiving end of those, uh, I can tell you that to not have any formal recommendations gives me great confidence that we've got the right systems in place. Um, the, the auditors are not shy of giving formal recommendations if they think there's something wrong. So that's that's good news. And I think it's really good practice as well to have an action plan to deal with their observations. Um, and that will be useful next time they audit to be able to demonstrate that we take their observations seriously as well. Um, and my other uh, point of reflection was around uh, your comments on the people survey, I think, and the, one of the priorities for that being around bullying and harassment. Um, just to feed back some feedback we had from some meat inspectors the other day who believe they'd had really very good support from FSA management when having to deal with those issues. So I think that reflects well uh, on, on your desire at management level to treat that as a serious matter. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Emily, do you want to pick up any points? Uh, I'm not sure I, I need to... I mean, thank you for the offer of support from the board. Um, it, the, the, obviously, you um, coming to formal conclusions that we need access to the PACE powers, and I think you've been doing that for the last three or four years, is extremely helpful for us to rely on when we make our case. We also yeah. were told by the National Order Office that they thought we needed them, um, and, so it, it, and that was in 2019. So, you know, it, it does all help. Um, and there may be other ways that we can ask have words with people and and uh, make that representation but we'll we'll take that and have a think about it thank you okay thanks emily mark is next um yes also totally emily um fully behind you and colleagues on work to get the uh pace powers and uh congratulations to you and the teams for the work they do on exposing those who may put unsafe or out of date food into our supply chains. Um, on the shortage of vets, um, still a problem. Does it add then to the case uh, for having in future more than one service delivery partner to help us recruit them in future? And uh, that's question one. And the other one, has COVID or EU exit made any difference to the high levels of subsidies the FSA um, gives, in effect, to the meat industry, um, obviously for historic reasons, whether or not we like it? Emily. Thanks. Um, two slightly different questions there, thank you. Um, so on, on the shortage of vets, um, does that contribute to the case for more than one service delivery partner? The shortage of vets is affecting every user of vets in the country. Um, that's the Animal and Plant Health Agency. That's the Food Standards, Food Standards Scotland. Um, it's the it, it's us, um, and it's also a number of private sector providers. So um, that there is a structural issue with the workforce. Um, I mean, I think what it proves is that um, it's hard to attract vets on the price that we are paying for them at the moment, uh, and that's why. Uh, and there is quite a strong market, particularly from the private sector. For vets who are um, able to do export health certificate work in particular. So, uh, and we just don't know yet whether that's going to settle down, whether it's just a, a sort of three to six month effect um, of the post Brexit situation, or indeed whether the, um, the grace periods uh, that are expiring from Northern Ireland will drive in even more increased demand on the vet front. It it's, feels quite a volatile situation. So, so I would say that um, what it might make the case for is a more expensive service. Um, but uh, I think the question about one service delivery partner versus many is what we will consider as we do our business case um, before we go out to tender um, the next time. Um, and we're giving some very careful thought to that. There are a number of factors that we want to consider. Um, on uh, whether COVID or EU exit has um, altered the question about the high level of subsidies um, that the meat industry gets. So we, we to the, and Colin and Chris will correct me on the figures, but I think it's about 20 million pounds of taxpayers' money that we offer to um, the meat industry for some of the um, charges that we would otherwise make. We also charge them and, and they pay um, for the service that they get from us. Um, that is a question that is, is one for the Treasury, it's one for um, DEFRA, I would say. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious that the meat industry has also been through quite a tough time in the last few months um, because of COVID. Um, and there are a number, so there are a number Say, but I think it's a sort of economic question and less a question for the regulator. Okay, thanks, Emily. I can see Colin and Chris both want to come in. So, um, Colin, let's start with you. 
thanks very much, Ruth. Yes, so um, just to, to add to what Emily has said, I think um, uh, there are many factors that impact on the, the position around the vets. I'm not sure the single provider is the, the main one. Uh, in a sense, the the service delivery partner or partners are fishing in the same pool. So it's the fact that there's a shortage, there's a finite number, rather than necessarily the number of providers that we engage with. Although it's one of many factors that we look at as we undertake the ops transformation program going forward for a more sustainable long-term solution. And in terms of um, support to the meat industry during COVID and uh, EU transition, uh, there was one case where during COVID there were there was significant amounts of downtime uh, just because of the pandemic that uh, the agency did support uh, the meat industry during that period. But in general terms, the uh, the charges are set separately uh, and uh, wouldn't be affected. Thanks, Colin. Chris? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to build on um, a couple of points there. Firstly, in relation to that, it's just to build on what Colin said there. Um, the FSA obviously goes through a very robust um, tender process. Um, to, to um, appoint the service delivery partner and um, all options are considered and will be considered uh, the next time we do it. And we want to optimize value for money um, and we do prioritize quality and service um, over, over cost. Um, in terms of the charging, um, yeah, Emily was absolutely right. It is around about 20 million in terms of the, the cost to the FSA, um, which, which uh, transpires through the discount on, on the charge rates. The total cost, um, of the official controls for me is around about 50 million. So you can see it's, um, it is it is weighted towards industry. I would also say that obviously according to HMT guidance, uh, the treasury uh, do ask for full cost recovery. Um, for reasons I won't go into, um, the, the FSA at the moment is not there. And Emily did indicate there that, that um, as the regulator, it's not really the position we want to be in, in terms of uh, subsidizing uh, the meat industry. In terms of the technical question on, on the cost of COVID and what's in the charge rates and what isn't, we do base the charge rates um, on a budgeted number so that industry does have a very clear idea about what it is going to be charged for in the coming year and can plan accordingly. Um, and therefore, the additional costs that we saw in last year weren't expected and weren't budgeted. Um, so the FSA absorbed that, whereas some of, some of the costs for the service delivery partner for this year our budgeted and therefore are uh, paid to some extent by industry. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And then over to Peter for comment or question. Um, the alert which occurred last night, Colin was uh, describing the action taken. Can I just ask whether we have a facility for notifying vets? Because uh, although you're taking the action about the food chain suppliers, um, if the vets know that there is an, uh, a potential problem and they see uh, cats being brought to them with certain symptoms, to know that this might be a chain of cause uh, and what the nature of the problem might be could be useful. Do we notify vets? Is that part of our system? Thanks, Peter. Colin? Uh, we and the FSA don't notify the vets, but this, this is a multi-agency response with APHA and DEFRA involved. They will have those connections on the basis of animal health uh, considerations. Okay, thank you. So, um, any other comments or questions on Emily's report? Just to say thank you for the uh, clarity of the work on live viral mollusks and um, the rigour which you've applied to the science base on that. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's very impressive that uh, you've been able to do that quite quickly. Uh, obviously, noting in the report as well that the basic issue is water quality, but of course, that's not our responsibility. Uh, are we involved in any conversations about the uh, water quality aspects, because obviously there are different responsibilities in different nations. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so we, we um, as you say, we are responsible for classifying the waters. The classification is a product of how dirty or clean the waters are. Um, and it's striking that the waters in Scotland, for instance, um, are tend in Northern Ireland tend to be cleaner than the waters in England and Wales, where there's higher population. So that is the, the fundamental issue um, sitting underneath this. Um, 
the, the um, in Wales, for instance, and we're very conscious of um, producers around Menai Strait, um, Natural Resources Wales is responsible for water quality, um, and we have been in touch uh, significantly with officials at Welsh level, um, and uh, and have been keeping ministers in, um, informed as to what we've been doing, um, and we do keep making that point. And similarly, in England, uh, um, you and I have both spoken to um, Victoria Prentice, who's the Food Minister at DEFRA um, about the water quality issues as much as some of these classification questions. Um, what we've what we've done, um, as I said, is is evidence based. It still protects public health. Um, it's it's some quite small tweaks really to the way that we are looking at anomalous results. There are a number of other way uh, the issues on sampling that um, that we want to look at too. Um, but we'll prioritise those where we think um, the, the evidence suggests they can make a difference. Um, but underneath it all is it is that there's there's dirty water with poo in it um, is the core issue and that's what needs to be addressed fundamentally. Thank you for that um, and uh, also uh, thank you uh, for working with industry. I think pretty uh, just to identify the issues and and um, where areas can um, uh, be identified to make progress. But as you say, uh, the underlying issue also needs to be addressed of water quality. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, um, the, there's been some really good and thorough work that the Shellfish Association, Great Britain, um, uh, and the industry have done um, looking at different comparative approaches. So, it, it's been really helpful to have that input. Yeah. But, you know, as always, our focus is the public's health and uh, making sure that uh, we, we uh, uphold that as, uh, completely. Okay. Um, any other points on the report? No, it looks like that's it. Emily, thank you very much indeed. Um, for that uh, update today. Uh, so I'm going to move us on to the performance and resources report and ask Chris Hitchin, Director of Finance Performance, to present the report. Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll take the report as read, just a few points to bring out. Um, the, fir the first one is on slide seven, where we've already touched um, in Robin's really useful update in his annual report on the levels of the four pathogens of foodborne disease that we've seen in 2020 and how COVID has led to some quite um, unusual um, results. And as Robin's already said, there's lots of work um, on going to better understand exactly how COVID has impacted on those four pathogens. So I won't say any more than that. Um, moving on to slide eight is a new slide on sampling, which really, really aims to summarize the, the FSA and, and partners position in 2020 on the testing it's done to give assurance on both food safety and on food standards. Um, as Colin referred to in his ARAC update, um, it was one of the NEO's recommendations on the ensuring food safety and standards value for money report. So, you know, we're, we're very pleased to be able to, to report that to, uh, to board members. Um, the thing to point out is that testing is often targeted um, based on other intelligence. Um, so that will obviously impact the number of uh, number of positive results um, seen in the data. In terms of slide 12 and 13, just to point out that um, there was a, a discussion at the uh, March Business Committee on staff engagement, but the, these two slides just add in the uh, civil service-wide comparators for board members. The final thing that I'll mention, um, although we've already talked about it, is the resources on slides 14 and 15. Obviously, we've seen a 7% underspend, as Emily's already outlined, um, and the reasons for which we've already discussed. Um, and we're taking action uh, to make sure that we use all of all of the uh, funding available in this year in the ways that we've outlined. So I won't say any more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So any questions to Chris? Observations? Mark? Thanks, Ruth. Um, Chris, thanks for this. It's always, as as always, it's really helpful. My my comments and questions are around the sampling uh, page because that is the new page and it's something I have some experience in. Um, my first one is just a reflection. I'm astonished uh, that out of over a thousand uh, labelling assessments, only seven were found to be non-compliant. Um, certainly, my experience is that it would be completely the other way around. That you know we. In, in the public sector laboratories, we see as many as, as sort of 75% of labels that are non-compliant. Uh, so I'm really, really quite surprised by that figure, I have to be honest. Um, but that's a minor point. Actually, the important point from my point of view is that um, we've shown non-compliances here, but actually 
non-compliances isn't really the story because the the whole purpose of, of sampling and, and the wider uh, surveillance work is to is to see what's going on. It's not necessarily to find out what's wrong. Um, so whilst non-compliance is important to be able to allow follow-up, actually just the information and the intelligence that sampling and testing generates is as important, in my view, certainly, as identifying uh, non-compliances. Um, and uh, the other the other reflection is is around the fact that uh, I think you mentioned that a lot of this testing is is targeted, um, and I'm just quite keen to understand where all of the information to support that targeting comes from. I know the FSA has a lot of data, a huge amount of data, um, but I'm sure there are other sources as well. I'm just looking for reassurance that we're taking all of those sources uh, into account when we're targeting, and and possibly even using some of that to test. Uh, hypothesis where we're not thinking there's a particular risk issue, but we want to test something that we've never tested before, for example. Thanks. Chris, do you want to comment? Sir? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, what, what I would suggest is that um, we, we probably come back to you on those comments, that there's some really good questions there. I, I certainly don't know off the top of my head, um, the detail behind the seven out of a thousand samples that you mentioned. Um, there, may, there may be some colleagues who want to comment uh, who are on the call, um, but um, I would definitely suggest that in terms of the the, the, the sources of information, um, there's obviously been been papers presented to the board on how the whole system fits together at earlier, at earlier moments. but. A worked example as to how that actually feeds into the sampling we're doing. I'm sure we could put that together for you. Thank you. It sounds like it'd be useful to have a, a briefing, a bit more depth on it uh, for board members. Rick, do you want to comment? Yeah, just to to um, support what Chris has said, we we can um, we we can pull something together which might hi highlight how we do that because I think one of the the key things that we have done is as we've developed a more risk-based approach is how we've reached out to try and get the, the right intelligence um, to, to support those and target those things. Um, this is a targeted list that was based on on, on evidence from, from across government, but also uh, across the FSA, across government, but also trying to pull on um, industry uh, evidence as well, and actually evidence coming from the labs. And one of the things we found from um, doing the work that we did in 2020, that doesn't cover all this sampling, but covers a certainly a large portion of the um, the thousand or so samples that were taken on standards. Um, you know, it, it was the interaction with the official control labs and that kind of feedback loop that was very useful as well. And that was something we'll carry forward. So um, a lot of learning from the program we put in place during COVID to look at disruption then, but how we then take those sampling programs forward. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot more of a cohesive um, an integrated approach to, to gathering intelligence, but we'll, it would be a yeah, good idea to put that down on, on paper, and maybe characterise that. So, yeah, we can do that. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Fiona. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chris. It, it's a really helpful um, paper, and my question is still on slide eight. Um, which is if we're going to continue to present this data on a regular basis and presumably also feeding into the annual report we were talking about in the last session, what, what are acceptable levels um, so that we have a, a high or low register and we are able to understand whether um, there are significant areas of issue that are becoming unacceptable or too big? Thank you. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks for the question, Fiona. Uh, in, in terms of a, at a high level, what I would say is that uh, at the moment, um, the FSA is planning to do some, some longitudinal um, time series sampling that will give us an idea about what is going on over time on food standards. Obviously, as I mentioned, this is um, this is relatively um, new in the way that we're thinking about this, and, and it's off the back of um, Rick's um, strategy that was presented to the board fairly recently. Um, what we usually do then, and what I would propose that we do here, is, is then bring recommendations <clears throat> to the business committee in terms of any targets that we feel are appropriate or any ambition that we feel are appropriate based on some of the longitudinal data that we're seeing. Um, but that would be my very high level response to how we usually deal with it. I don't know if Rick or others would 
uh, want to comment specifically? Yeah, I, I think just to, to add to that, I think one of the things that we need to do is, um, and it's a very good point, is about understanding what the, the real baseline is. I mean, one of the challenges we found with the sampling program was, for example, we did a load of work around herbs, was there was a lot of noise coming out um, in the system about really high levels of um, substitution, et cetera, in herbs. Actually, we didn't find that evidence when we went and actually did our, our survey. So again, it's it's trying to find the one version of the truth about where those where those levels of adulteration and non-compliance are is really critical. And, and, and it is complicated and it will take a bit of time. Um, but, I, but I think by just starting that work and doing it in a structured way, we do have the opportunity to actually create something useful, which we can then put the metrics on. I think the other thing to say about metrics and targets, though, is of course the more you look, the more you find. So if you wanted zero compliance, if you wanted a zero rating of um, a, a zero um, findings rating, don't do any testing. So uh, you know there's there's simple solutions to these things, but they're not meaningful. So um, the the way to do things is to, is is to understand what what the the real level is, um, and of course never underestimate the fact that if you start taking action, you do then cause um, activity to happen and 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 you force compliance as well. So um, there is something to be said for, you know, waving the big stick and sometimes it does actually have a, an impact on how people behave. So talk softly, thank carry a big stick. <laughs> so thank you, Rick. And, and it just illustrates the benefit of the board having access to data that gives us a rich conversation about um, the headline message, but also the issues underneath. Emily wanted to come in. Yeah, it was it was just a tiny point to add to what Rick and Chris have said, which is just a, there's a tiny bit in the in the um, on the slide which says sampling is often targeted at areas of highest risk, <clears throat> and I, I just wanted to mention that the way the sampling uh, program was designed, it was going after areas where we were worried that there would be fraud, so it was likely to be a less compliant um, set, um, and I think Rick's point about you know if we were to can we get a baseline of um, a, a, across all goods, including the ones that um, we're not so worried about uh, based on intelligence. That's quite a big um, activity to do. Um, Rick certainly been giving some thought to a basket of goods approach to this sort of um, sampling work. We do want to do more on it. Um, but so I'd be a bit worried about setting a sort of threshold of what we thought was normal, just not least because we've already skewed it towards the things that are more risky. Um, but I do, I think you're right, Fiona, to ask the question, which is how would we know if it was within our tolerance of of, um, of uh, some kind of authenticity risk or not. I think we need to go away and think about that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I just wanted to um, highlight the local authority uh, delivery statistics and uh, just uh, to link back to the recovery paper that we considered uh, in the May board meeting. And obviously these data relate to historical activity and part of the reason uh, we have a recovery roadmap is, is to uh, improve the situation. So I just wondered, uh, Maria, maybe whether you'd comment on um, how, how the initial response is, is emerging. And, and uh, obviously, by the time we get to September, we should start to see a, a change in the situation. And any informal feedback so far? I'm very happy to, Ruth. Thank you. Um, firstly, it, from the slide, you'll see that there has been a small improvement in quarter four in relation to the actual physical interventions that are taking place. So um, we would usually see in and around 17,000 interventions per month, and we're up to about just close to 10,000, which is good. Um, the feedback, the, the anecdotal feedback that we're getting from the environmental health uh, food liaison groups is that they're very happy with the board's decision and they're very um, willing and able to step up now and um, uh, commence working on the roadmap to recovery. Um, lots of these businesses are only just starting up again, finding their feet. Um, we're going to um, give local authorities a little bit of help in terms of um, allowing um, a little pot of money to help them to support um, uh, all off-site in um, conversations with food businesses, just phoning them up and saying, you know, what are you up to? What are you doing? What's your what 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 are your working hours, for example? So that those officers can then target what they do and where they go. So that's happening now, um, and uh, we're really hopeful that we we will get good compliance across the board on the roadmap. Excellent. That's uh, good to hear. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I don't see any other comments on the uh, performance and resources paper. 
Um, so just to say thank you very much, Chris. Um, once again, a clear, uh, comprehensive um, uh, review of uh, progress. So thank you for that. So I think we're moving to any other business and um, none was notified. So I can just say that the next business committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, the 15th of September. And again, time, venue and agenda to be confirmed. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. We'll see you in September. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Ruth.